Hello, hello, Rick, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, good, good, good. Just double-checking audio. Uh, say, say something real quick. Something real quick. Okay, let me turn you down just a tiny bit. And I think we're good. Uh, folks in the chat, let me know if my music or anything is too loud or if there are any sound issues. Um, yeah. So uh, thanks for having me in Stoker uh, for your home con. Really appreciate it. Um, Stokes will be along soonish, I believe. So you wanted to uh, talk about comics a little bit, huh? Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I know a thing or two about that. Yeah, the people want to hear stuff about comics. They've yeah. Been They've been excited for more talks, more talking. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Should I should I just start or like do you, did you uh, did did you want to did you want to like start on something specific or what do you have in mind? I don't have anything in mind. I've been winging okay. this entire weekend. All right, <laughs> not a problem. Um, well, I'll just start going through my list and let me know if you need me to stop or, or anything. Um, so, for those who don't know me, I'm I'm Jonas. Hi, um, I do uh, I do comics. Um, I actually help Rick now a little bit with comics. I have a minor role uh, in the production on some of the uh, some of the some of his comics. I do I do flats things like that. Um, I've been doing this a long time. Well, I've been drawing a long time. I've only really seriously been doing comics for about the last two years. Uh, you know, um, and uh, I generally work best. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, 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 how's it going? Um, I generally work best inside a team. Um, and in that context, I've learned a lot about the process. It's uh, considerably more organ. I'm considerably more organized now about it than I used to be. Um, and uh, Jay and Squire asks if, he, if they can join the vocal chat this time as well. Um... Uh, no, because we're on a different. Oh right, yeah, that's right. We're on, the we're on a different server. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Jan, we'll probably we'll probably do a little bit of Q and A later on. I think right now I'm just gonna talk about technique a little bit. Um, actually, the first thing I want to talk about regarding comics for those of you interested in doing it, I'm fine, Draco. Thank you very much. Um, I want to talk a little bit about like logistics, like organizational methods for uh, production lines for this sort of thing, because you really need them, especially when you're on a big team, as I am, uh, and you're trying to coordinate a lot of different people doing different different segments of a comic at the same time. So, basically, one of the most popular tools for this sort of thing is Trello. Um, let me jump over to my browser real quick. Yeah, basically, uh, there's a bunch of different options, but Trello's the most, you know, the, the most common one. Um, let, me, let me actually let me find my let me just load up my commission key so you can see an example. Um, chances are most of you guys are aware of this already, this particular uh, thing. But this is based on the Kanban system, which is very popular in Japan. It's just like a series of a series of boards and you and representing production phases, and you move, you know, each item in the production line along on the board indicating where it is so for my combine you've got you know the the planning the pencils the inks color shading background you know etc and finish now all of these can work just fine for a comic because the comic has all the same categories you know you have a pencils phase and a color phase and like you know there are a few extra ones that are unique comics like lettering things like that and um this is one very valid way of doing it. Uh, there are also other options like ClickUp, you know, uh, Monday.com, various other things. You know, essentially it all boils down to what works best for you and your team. There's going to be something that you you will you will find feels natural as far as like 
tr- tracking different you know production things. And generally, when you're working on a comedy, you're gonna you're gonna have multiple uh, things going on. You know, Rick's got what like six or seven projects happening simultaneously. Uh, um, something like that. And uh, three current currently three comics at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> man. Um, and with multiple people on the team, you're definitely going to want to know where everyone is in a given, you know, in a, in a given phase on a given project. So that is something you absolutely want to have, you know, in your, I, I'm going on the assumption that at least some people in the audience want to do comics like Rick or just want to do comics period, you know? Um, so I'm being, uh, sort of, I'm sort of in teacher mode right now. Everyone's used to me being kind of sassy and irreverent, like on the Twitch stream, but I'm actually being serious at the moment. Um, so that's that's an important aspect of this whole thing. Uh, another thing you're going to want to uh, be, you're definitely going to want to use our file boxes like Dropbox, you know? Uh, this one's just, again, even though this stuff is usually meant for large corporations, it's completely scalable down to smaller creative projects. You know, you just, um, I know it sort of sounds like I'm shilling for them right now, but, but you know, these these just happen to be, the most useful tools for this sort of thing that I've found, you know? Um, so yeah, you want to do like Dropbox, Google Drive. Um, there's a million choices out there. You want cloud backup for your project. You just, you want it, okay? Uh, you, backups you are it. always very good for things like this. Yeah, yeah. It's also, and it's also good because you can pool all the resources that you would need for comics, you know, for different people to work on it for comics, like, you know, page, you know, Pages in progress, uh, common assets like fonts, um, you know, palettes, you know, basically anything and everything that everyone on the team might at least need access to, you know, at any given point in the production so that everybody's on the same page, so to speak. So that's, uh, that's that. Uh, another thing you're definitely going to want to have when you probably already do because everyone has it now is Discord. Discord's just like the most universal thing for, you know, for, for doing production these days. Um, you can, you can, you can have a production team on telegram, but it's not, in my opinion, it's just not quite as good because telegram is more of just a straight up chatting system. Discord's got a little more organization, you know, it's sort of, it, you, you can have like different chats and smaller rooms. There's also little... like Slack, but I think discord does everything that Slack does <laughs> basically. Yeah, 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 and you could, and you know, you could probably coordinate on Slack for pro- for projects like these, but um, yeah, basically, uh, oh, Stoker is on the way. He just let me know. Um, now something else you can look into. It's not necessarily something you need for these kinds of projects, but it is helpful. Is automation uh, sites like if ifttt which stands for if if this then this or zapier or what have you can automate uh if, if you're using a lot of these sites like trello and g drive and whatnot and you want some interoperability uh then you want to look at the sites like this because they can create scripts and this takes a little bit of programming know-how but not really a lot uh, that will automate various tasks on things like the Trello boards, move cards for you, um, update you on one service when something else happens over there. Like, I, like at one point, uh, for one of the uh, production discords I'm on, I was looking into a bot that um, notifies me in a Discord channel when the when the ClickUp status, when, when the status of, of a card on the ClickUp that we use is changed. So that's another thing you can do. That's what I think you can do. It takes, it's a little advanced, but I mean, it's, in my opinion, it's worth it, you know, because um, it, the, the less you have to think about the logistics, the more you can focus on the art, right? Oh, uh, the logistics stuff. You do that up front, and once it's set, you don't usually have to think about it too hard, even if it, like, seems a little <laughs> overwhelming to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a lot better than just trying to wing it for every single page. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about? I literally just got here. Hi, Stoker. <laughs> Hello. Hello. It's your friendly neighborhood vampire bat. <laughs> yes. Stoker is my frequent collaborator. For those who don't know, we work together on the Naked Penny comic, um, and we've done a, we've done a couple other little projects together. Um, he used to be my roommate. It's true. I did. And, I used to uh, stand outside your door and stare. Yes, it's true. And now we met, 
Now, now we make furry stuff together. It's it's, uh, <laughs> it's the circle of life. Um, uh, now I was I was just talking about like logistics and <coughs> you know the the boring stuff in as far as the production chain like Trello and whatnot. Um, and uh, now that you're here, we could probably talk about the writing a little bit if you want. We could. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Suddenly. Randomly, one of you, uh, one of you unmuted, and I suddenly started hearing an echo. Uh, it shouldn't be. I should. My audio should be consistent. You shouldn't be hearing any repeats through me. No, no, no. I mean, on um, Picardo, it randomly oh. unmuted. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Gotcha. So, um, so I know virtually nothing about writing. I, I know the theory. The, like the, the principles of story, I've read Robert McKee's story. I've and all about the hero's journey and uh, that stuff. But this is more like Rick and Stoker's territory. Um, we had right Greg's talk yesterday on how to write. Oh, that's story. true. That's true. That's true. Oh, should we should we just move on? <laughs> <laughs> no, we can oh, talk about see, story people too. are saying people are saying hi to me in the chat. Hello, Rook. Hello, Game Cobra. Hello, Dan. Hello. Uh, JN Squire, hey Ty, hey, uh, Shmutwilvidate, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, <laughs> SHM, hey Drag Wolf, hey Knickknack, uh, and hey anyone that I missed. <laughs> I just want to make sure I, I said hey to everyone. There are hundreds anyway, of you. Writing is simple, you just, you just say words and stuff. Yeah, it's just you know you you just make thing happen. You make thing happen. Yeah, see, very good. Um, but no, actually, writing is a bitch and a half. So <laughs> <laughs> I do not consider myself an authority on this. Whenever I've tried to write, I write in a very strange way. I write backwards. I kind of reverse engineer everything from the ending. So um, what you're saying is you have to. You uh, so what you're saying is you have to uh, take what you've written and look at it in the mirror to understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, uh, it's it's a code. Um, <laughs> no, I just I, I I've been told my writing's okay, but I really I I don't feel like I feel like I, I the reason you haven't seen a solo project for me yet is that it is largely because I don't consider my my writing quite up to snuff. Um, I have literally had moments where. The characters will be standing around my head, looking at me like, okay, what do we do now? And I'm like, I don't know. You figure it out. You're in the story. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, told, uh, that's when things get weird. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been told that, uh, yeah. And I've been told that basically that's how it is for everybody. And you really, you have to stop expecting it to feel like it's on, on plan and then just go with whatever your brain does. <laughs> In my case, that doesn't mean a whole lot because uh, it just kind of stops. <laughs> but um, if either of you have any additional insights on it, on the process, please feel free. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sketch stuff. <laughs> or I could, or I could talk more about the production end of stuff. I mean, it's it's kind of weird because uh, the way we do our own comic is very uh, atypical <laughs> for the way furry comics are done. <laughs> Well, we're we're learning as we go. You know, um we both are. You know, it's 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 perfectly okay to admit that. Um basically we just like we jumped into this thing at the beginning of the Panini and um you know, it it it, it has been a a process of discovery. Um I feel like Rick probably has like you know, probably has more, you know, a more consistent approach than us. Um, uh, I mean, starting out, it basically have been exactly the same way that you're doing it. So flailing about, not quite sure how this is going together, <laughs> but, uh, somehow forcing it to just coalesce. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Rick has, uh, has sheer force of will going for him. <laughs> Rick is the force to be contented, contented, contended with. Contenulated. Continue. Continuate. Right, anyway, let's, let's not get too silly now. Um, Why? <laughs> That's what oh. they expect from us. <laughs> yes, but we're here to, uh, you know, we're here, we're to, here talk. to talk shop. Well, I mean, at least for a little bit. Then 
I don't know, maybe later we can get ridiculous. Um, but no, but I like think... it's it's. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please. No, but it's it's. You don't usually see, um, at least when it comes to furry web comics, you don't usually see uh, teams uh, working on them. You usually have either a solo creator, which is the most common, or you have like a duo, a writing and uh, art duo. But uh, we have a very small, uh, very, very low budget uh, production team. At this point, originally it was just me and Stoker, but we rapidly yes. realized that like we needed, you know, it, it, given the circumstances and our, and our own particular situations, we needed to take advantage of the, uh, of the team approach, because let's be honest, that's kind of, the, I mean, this is my opinion, but I kind of feel like that's the future with this stuff. You know, once upon a time when web comics, you know, 20 years ago, when web comics were just sort of built on the template of the Sunday funnies, you know, and it was like, you mm -hmm. know, relatively small palette, you know, simple character designs. Uh, you know, no epic stories, just, you know, ha ha, four panel punchline. It was a lot easier for just one guy to do it. Uh, I'm sorry, one, one, per one person to do it. Um, and nowadays the bar has been raised. Uh, thanks in part to, uh, you know, some of the, uh, some of the furry stories that have been out there in the last uh, couple decades. Um, these days, you know, things, they don't have to be lavish, but very often they are, you know? Yes, you have and a lot more to compete with, for one thing. Yeah. <laughs> you is, sure true. do. You're, yeah. you're not competing with a uh, random dragon comic uh, drawn in MS Paint. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that was one of my favorites back in the day. <laughs> um, and it's great that the bar has been raised, but it's also, in a way, it's kind of intimidating, especially for someone who uh, has never really played around in this arena you know i mean i've done comics before I, I my first uh my first sequential art that anyone saw in any form of print whatsoever was 1990 1999 yeah and uh it was um <laughs> it was a backup for an old furry, uh, an old furry print comic uh, published through Shonda Fantasy Arts uh, by Mike and Carol Curtis, and I didn't know what I was doing, and it was really incredibly awful. I mean, no, the, okay, the comic wasn't bad. What I mean, I, sh I don't, I don't want to like, you know, because Mike, Mike wrote the backup, and his writing's fine. You know, his writing's fine. The comic itself, you know, it, it, it was. Um, the production design of the publication was adequate. My art was awful. And, you know, I was in my 20s back then, and I learned nothing. And, <laughs> and uh, basically, everything that's... All the, all the evolution my art's gone through, including, including current projects, has been through trial and error. I don't really, quote-unquote, know what I'm doing. But that's the essence of it, because, you know, fake it till you make it. Um, and essentially at some point you'll know, you know, you'll reach this point where like people are like, wow, your stuff's so professional. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> you're like, ha ha, I fooled you all. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about the process if, uh, if nobody minds, because there's there's a lot of stuff that I want to like impart to people. If you want to do this stuff that I learned sometimes by accident, sometimes through like mistakes, trial and error, and sometimes only because like somebody linked me to a tweet. Uh, <laughs> hey, whatever works, man. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, Let's, without further... Well, let me finish this cute little picture of Penny first. Did you want to add anything, Stoker? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing... I'm, I'm being the, uh, the, the chatty dude. I'm totally, like, not giving you a chance. You're being golly gee whiz, Jonas. Jeez! Such a it. chatty Kathy. <laughs> um... I mean, hell, uh, the whole thing is... Uh, is is about learning as you go when you talk about uh you know faking it till you make it and you never really completely understand what you're doing you never well, really 
Go ahead, go ahead, please. Um, it's, I mean, it's only that's... like until afterwards you look back and you're like, huh, I guess I did learn something. It didn't feel like I learned anything. <laughs> Dear Princess Celestia. But, uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's just as true, uh, for the writing side of things as it is any other, uh, any other aspect of it. I mean, Penny is not the first, uh, comic project I have ever been a part of. Uh, my ex and I had several, um, back in the day. Um, that, uh, you know, they, they, the, some of them, some of them got, uh, got further along than others, and, you know, but, uh, Penny so far has been, I guess, the most, uh, successful one <laughs> I've been a part of so far. But, um, where are you snickering about there, Jonas? No, nothing, nothing, go on. <laughs> it's, um,. But there's so many things, so many things uh, that I've learned just in the relatively brief amount of time that we're doing this. Um, there's there's a lot of things I would do differently if I could re mm -hmm. if I could do it over. But uh, that way lies madness. Um, you got to be careful about that because uh, you know some people do uh, restart projects over and over and over again. <laughs> Hmm. And the the tricky part is sometimes restarting a project is the right decision to make. <laughs> but it's it's one of those things where uh it's perfectionism is your biggest enemy when it yeah. comes to anything like this. Yeah, don't focus on perfect because, you know, Stoker is correct. You will go absolutely insane as we really know this um <laughs> like i i have like the story for that because before i actually started house pets like several years before i was doing a different web comic for in the new age and i got uh something like 40 pages into it and then i looked back at it and i was like this is terrible i need to start over and I tried starting over. I got like a few pages into starting over, and then I was just like, yeah, I don't know. I'm not doing good enough at this. And then I stopped making comics for a while. And mm. that was a problem because I wasn't making comics. I wasn't posting anything. And I had this story idea in my head that I really wanted to get out, but I knew that I just did not have the skill to pull it off. Mm. And that's basically why I started House Pets is because I was like, you know what? If I just do something very silly that I've always something else I've always wanted to do that's very silly and probably doesn't need to be as perfect uh, then I will be able to actually learn how to make the comic that I want to make. And that's basically <laughs> happened uh, over time. <laughs> and now everybody likes House Pets uh, primarily because that's the one that they know me from the most mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what it makes me think of it makes me think of how uh matt graining didn't want to license his uh life in hell comic because he wanted to keep the rights so he just came up with the simpsons as something disposable i mean basically that's <laughs> what <it was. laughs> yes that's right i did just call house pets the simpsons of furry comics <laughs> Uh, Except Miller... it hasn't gotten bad yet. <laughs> <laughs> Miller has a question for Jonas slash Stoker. Ah. I feel like I have skill and I can make stuff that's worth something. How do I take the skills I have and use them to buy groceries, pay rent, etc.? Oh, isn't that the question? You know, I always questions like that. I always get tempted to give like the sassy answer, like you can't. Sorry, because <laughs> you're a monster, Jonas. I am, but no, um. The serious answer, and this is the, the disclaimer, is that I I don't necessarily know what I'm talking about. Not authority is that fundamentally you can break any skill down to a method of information processing in your brain. You know, I mean, the brain only has so many ways to uh, process stuff. You know, visual, spatial, uh, schematic, mathematical, uh, rhythmic. You know, like music. Um, uh, auditory, like tonal relationships, and all of these processes play a role in any any job process. You know, you're doing a certain amount of 
you know, with any job, you're doing a certain amount of like spatial reasoning. That's big in you know artistry, obviously, uh, design, photography, etc. You're you're doing a little bit of logistic planning. That is assuming you know you you know I mean okay, unless you know unless it's a really really right brain job, you're doing some logistic stuff. You're you know, bottom line, you're doing processes that are they're they're implicit but they're fundamental, and what you really need to do is, in my opinion, break down the the thing that you do into the core processes and ask yourself, how can I apply these to a paid position? You know, if if you know if if the goal is making rent doing this, you know, is it going to be what you think it is? Or are there other fields where you could perhaps do the same thing in a cognitive sense and still make money, maybe even make more money if that's if that's the priority. That's that's my two cents. Well that was more like five bucks, but whatever. Stoker. Right? <laughs> uh I may I may actually be the wrong person to uh is anyone <laughs> calling me? How dare they? Oh no, that's just my cell phone alarm. Um I may be the wrong person to uh, to ask about this because I have never made a full time living uh, just off of uh, you know creative stuff like Rick and Jonas have. <laughs> uh, both of y'all have paid the bills with art. Uh, that is not something I have ever done with art or writing. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, always had uh, some form of uh, alternative financial arrangement. But uh, honestly, I thought your assessment sounded, you know, it makes sense to me. I would add that the only reason I know this, again, this has been through trial and error, it's been kind of a grueling experience. Because at one point, I've worked, let's see, I've worked a bunch of retail. Um, I once mm -hmm. worked in an administrative position in a hospital. That's a whole other story. Um and I've uh, done a couple of like pre-pressed. Uh, I've done a lot of graphic design, and I've done a, and I've also worked like pre-pressed jobs in in printing outfits. Um, and again, I was I, I was so involved in all of these, just struggling to. Oh, and I've worked I've worked data entry and marketing. Um, I, I, yeah. I will be right back. One second. Keep talking. Sure. Uh, and in the midst of all these, I was so engaged in just trying to stay on top of things and learn everything that I didn't really have any time for analysis. Now, years later, looking back, and I realize I can look at those and say, okay, the reason this job was difficult was that I was easy, you know, it was easy to do this, but very difficult for my particular brain to do this, you know, like, uh, like with, with data entry. Um, there was a job I had a few years ago. Um, at a corporation uh, here in Seattle where uh, I was handling a an emulated... It, it, they'd been around so long and were handling records that were so old that they uh, had a database... I know this is probably like really boring. I'm sorry. Uh, they are handling a database that was so old that they that the original program and the original terminals that they used to do it, you know, like 80s era stuff, green screen kind of kind of thing, were no longer available. They were only emulated on newer systems. And the programming was was hand spun by somebody in the 80s. It was not based on, it was not forked off of any existing programming language as far as I could tell, or if it was, it was an obscure one. So I was stuck in this situation and there was no, there was no sandbox, there was no practice. They just dumped me into the deep end. So basically I was doing, I was trying to learn while editing records live, you know, in live fields without the modern amenities like Control Z, you know, while the boss was, you know, pacing around and smoking cigarettes and glaring at me. And, <laughs> and the job didn't last, obviously. But in retrospect, I was able to say, okay, this worked well, this didn't, etc. And that was one of the motivators for me to eventually go completely freelance. Although that has also been a learning curve. You basically can't do that. If you're serious about this, if you're serious about making money off this stuff, you cannot afford not to be mindful a little bit. You absolutely have to allow yourself the time to, whether it's whether you're a success or a failure at any given task, at any given um, position, you must allow yourself, and this isn't just with art, this is with anything, you must allow yourself the time to engage in analysis. This can tip over into overthinking it pretty easily, but nonetheless, it's still important because it helps you understand 
uh, what, what kind of career really works for you. And it may not be what you think it is. I hope you've enjoyed my TED Talk. Um, anyway, <laughs> I don't know, Rick, do you have anything to add? Uh, like, if you're really serious about it, one of the things that you have to accept is that it's going to be a business. And, you know, business work is very stupid and boring if you're not personally a business major. Mm-hmm. But uh, to some degree, like, you don't, you don't have to... Uh, Take a business course if you don't want to, but you do have to engage with the business side of whatever you're doing in order to actually go through the process of extracting money from it, because it's not going to do that on its own. You you don't just, I mean, you can just like do the bare minimum of uh, getting uh getting it an ad service onto your website and then sticking that up and then just taking the residuals from that. Like you could just do that and stop there. And that was basically a lot of what I did very early on with house pets back when project wonderful was a thing. And that was much easier and uh, less harrowing for people. Oh yeah. I remember that. (laughs) But you don't make a lot of money doing that. If you want to make more money doing that, you have to do more business stuff. And you have to be thinking about business stuff at least some of the time. Uh, and there's definitely like business stuff that I am not good at. And as a result, I dip my toes in it every once in a while to see if there's something that I can do. But if there isn't, then I just put that aside because there's other better things I could be doing with my time. Absolutely. That is, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm 100% on the same page with you. <laughs> Um, things have gotten a lot better for artists in the last, you know, last decade or so. But yeah, everything everything Rick is saying is completely uh, completely true. So, um, I wanted to talk about some of the fun little things that you can do in Clip Studio Paint, um, because uh, there's a lot to learn, and people are very intimidated by this program and it's understandable as to why, but they, they really have a lot of great little things that can boost efficiency, um, which I will show you right now. So one of the, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to glance on these. There's more to go into with each of them, but I'll leave it to people on their own to explore it. Um, there are a number of nifty features and innovations that are unique to this program, like preset frame templates that you can just pull out of uh, materials and pop in there. And then you can slice them up as needed using a frame division tool. It's very handy. You can do diagonal ones and funny shaped ones and, you know, circle ones and squiggly irregular ones and whatnot. Um, And then manipulate them as needed. Um, This is absolutely something worth uh, engaging with uh, and learning because uh, it lets you have tremendous versatility as far as frame layout. And each of these little frames is like its own tiny little canvas. You can put things in there and they will respect the frame borders. Um, So that's one thing uh, definitely worth looking into. Now, uh, a huge part of page layout uh, is kind of dictated by word balloons. I used to... (laughs) I used to put word balloons kind of like the last priority. Uh, because I figured, oh, you know, I'll just, I'll just, just stick them in the corner there. As long as I leave enough space around the characters, I can just cram everything into, you know, wherever it fits. But, um, you know, you have to apply the rules of typography and basically just, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't just happen. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, let me find a comic by Rick, which is actually really good, um, Starring his characters Bruce and Roosevelt from House Pets. Let me just find this one second. Here we go. So uh, you should look this up. Uh, it's on for Affinity and also on Rick's Deviant Art page. Uh, it's a great little concise. <laughs> um, I, I drew this after seeing like the 100th picture on for Affinity, where two characters were talking to each other and their balloons were on the opposite sides of the picture. Even though there were like <laughs> multiple back and forth of them. 
<laughs> yeah, that's probably that would probably be a little maddening. Um, <laughs> but um, but this is you know this is good because you know it it incorporates both typographic and narrative uh, elements. Um, you know this is this is one example of this. You can also find stuff in like Scott McCloud's work. You know where he talks about the uh, the structure of the narrative as applied to uh, this particular kind of sequential art. And you have to, again, if you're serious about comics, you have to be aware of this. You just you have to. <laughs> um, and I have you know I have tried uh, to adopt it. Scott Go McCloud's ahead. Understanding Comics and Making Comics are very good books if you want to learn how to make comics. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I have tried to adopt the practice of when, when we do Penny, um, so can I do Penny? I, these days, I put the word balloons in first. Like, I, I, we work out the frame sizes and, and, um, word balloon positions before anything else goes in, including the pencils. So, uh, so that's that. Um, let's see. I do that too. I used to do it like the other way, but eventually you realize that even if you get the art correct, uh, you're usually wasting space by drawing the stuff that's going behind the balloon anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's see. What's the next one else did I want to... Covered word balloons, thumbnails, frame tools. Ah, here we go. So I want to talk for a minute about inking. Because there's a little thing you can do with inking uh, that not many people know about. Um, CSP gives you the option to ink on a vector layer, uh, which means vectors, uh, for those who don't know, are basically mathematical descriptions of change, like the describing, like an arrow, you know, like from one point to another. That's a vector. Um, I'm not explaining it very well because I'm not a math major, but here, look at it this way. Um, let's say I'm going to do a, a raster layer. A raster is, um, basically pixels. Like, you know, if I, if I zoom in on this, it's just pixels, you know, it's just, it's, you can see how the jaggies are like, this is just a blob now of data and you know, there's no, there's no more movability to it. But on a vector layer, like I'm making with Penny right now, these lines, once laid down, even though they look jaggy, retain the mathematical data that forms them. So if you ink on a vector layer, you can do things like this or this. Whoa, okay. Um, basically, and, it, and it's composed of control points, which you can also manipulate individually, uh, which I'm not doing correctly. Hold on a minute. Um, and this is kind of unique to this program. Adobe Illustrator and Inkscape also do this, but this is a relatively new philosophy, uh, and it's very, very handy. Um, I just strongly recommend it, and it's definitely worth checking out. That's a vector layer, and you can get that by um, when you're when you're making a layer. There'll be a little thing that you mouse over in the in the lower right hand corner that says, uh, "Oh, you can't see. hang on, you can't see it because I've got my uh, my curtains up." One second, let me go full frame. There we go. Um, it's down here in the layers palette in the lower right hand corner uh, where you can um, shoot, I can't highlight it, but you get the idea, you, you'll, you'll, you'll find it, you'll find it. Um, anyway, that's really, really, really useful for inking. Um, what else is there? Um, now, some of you may already know about this concept, but anti-aliasing is something you need to uh, at least be aware of. You have more uh, versatility with this, with the vector layers, because they also retain line information. But one thing you need to know is how this will interact with things like color fills. You can see now that, you know, the, the jaggies are kind of smoothed out, but I could also do this, and they become kind of crispy. Another thing you need to know is never, ever feed your vector layers after midnight. Yeah, thing, yeah. The, also, I'm uh, back. Hello. Hello. Um, by the way, either of you, feel free to interrupt me if uh, if you think there's anything uh, you want to interject with. Um, you know, I, while I was uh, while I was AFK, I was thinking a little bit about um, uh, some of what we were talking about. 
uh, yeah. in regards to um, everything. <laughs> Go on. And there's uh, there's there's some stuff I was thinking about that's probably things uh, that people already know uh, or are probably obvious, but it's it's worth restating. <laughs> Uh, because it's, despite the fact that it's fairly common knowledge and fairly common sense, people do still repeatedly lose sight of this. And that's that, uh, first and foremost, if you're trying to do any kind of creative venture, especially, um, uh, especially comics, is that your first audience has to be you. You have to make it something that you're into. You have to make it something that you're going to uh, enjoy doing, and I can't guarantee that you'll never get tired of it, <laughs> but uh, something that uh, it will be perhaps difficult for you to get tired of. Well, you will get tired of it, but mm -hmm. but the, the appeal of a project that really means something to you is that you will also, at some point, pick it back up again and, and feel something new with it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You'll always be um, uh, finding new ways to relate with and uh, engage with a project if you're making it something that you, you know, really, really love already. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, obviously, my own comic is super self-indulgent and <laughs> relevant, relevant to uh, many yeah. of my own interests. No. Yeah, I know, I know, shocking, it's true. But, but um... Yeah. But, I mean, the other thing is, the, the balancing act is that unless you want yourself to be the only audience for a comic, uh, you do at least have to be you know, able to make it accessible to another reader. Well, I mean, it... Jonas could write a comic entirely in gibberish <laughs> and make himself you're... giggle endlessly. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Don't know what you're talking Go on. But, uh, you know, you, you have to... You have to... <laughs> uh, I'm making myself giggle with that thought. But you have to ask, um... Yeah. Sorry, I lost my entire train of thought just then. There's a sweet spot. There's a point, you know, you see this... Art, art is an act of communication. So, yeah. you do need to meet your audience partway. Yeah. Even if you're expressing what you actually want to say. You don't necessarily have to become a demagogue and only ever say what the audience wants to hear. Yeah, I mean, if you're if that that's I mean that's sort of that's sort of Hollywood, you know that. Um, mm -hmm. That's the uh, uh, that that that's that's when like when you know the actor's doing just 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 finishing out the contract by you know phoning it in and going oh yeah well, I'll just I'll do this thing we'll find you um that you you know it you know it and you know the audience knows it and it won't be as interesting but at the same time you know there's a balance where like it's possible to get so avant-garde with a project with any project in any medium that you're no longer effectively communicating you're speaking your own language um and while that may be satisfying to you, you know, to, to, to your, your brain, uh, the audience is going, huh, what? You know, and you get like, you know, like David Lynch. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, the thing is that there is, <laughs> since you did bring up David Lynch, there is an audience for that kind That's of thing. That's true. Well, I mean, I mean, David Lynch does have uh, does have an audience, and it's yes. not even a terribly small audience. Yeah. No, I mean, you can do that. You can get away with it. You can you can you can tell a story, or even not even a story. You can have a narrative, or even just an image that is incomprehensible to anyone but you, and people will still appreciate it. They'll appreciate uh, but the one of the things about David Lynch is that he's not even entirely incomprehensible. He this definitely starts from a place where there is a uh, observable narrative going on. And then there's just all these things that are frayed at the edges where it starts to fall apart. And that's where the... That just adds on a layer of intrigue to it. <laughs> yeah. And and just for the record, folks, I love Lost Highway. Okay, I love, I love Lost Highway. I like Twin Peaks. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not ragging on them. I, uh, 
I do appreciate his work. It's, you know, he's I forget, guy. Jonas. Have you seen Eraserhead? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is uh, I've done this with uh, with a friend of mine. Uh, is sit someone down in front of a racer head who's never seen it and doesn't know anything about it and tell them nothing about it before I make them watch it. <laughs> Do not reveal the terrible secret of a racer head. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't reveal the secret ending to your friends. <laughs> You're a monster. <laughs> um, that makes me laugh so much. <clears throat> anyway. But uh, <laughs> what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. The, the, the point is that there's an audience for esoteric ideas, um, but uh, the more esoteric you make them, the smaller that audience is. And it's fine to have a small audience. Not everything needs to be the, you know, freaking Marvel Cinematic Universe. Oh, not everything can. Not everything should. I mean, it's... it's it, it, in the end, you know, deciding who your audience is ultimately is as important as deciding what story you want to tell. And that's also something I've deliberated quite a bit about because I have no idea who my audience is. A lot of my, a lot of the narratives in my head just spring out of nowhere. And I'm like, that, that was always like one of the questions that people asked me like early when I was starting to make comics and stuff. They're like, who is your audience? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I haven't met them yet. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get in my house, person? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let me save this. Remember to always save your files. Yeah, uh, uh, Control S is your friend. <laughs> control Z is also your friend. Just keep in control. Yeah. Um. Oh, refresh my ass. That's why I like Dune eighty four. Um. Had some moments. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Dune's, so? a hard, Dune's a hard story to tell, but that's a whole other tangent. Um, I mean, that's like a huge brick of a book. I liked it when he stuck his hand in the box and he was screaming. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's see. Um, <laughs> I like how we keep derailing ourselves. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's awesome. Makes it fun but, for um, the audience. <laughs> it's true. Make, there we go. A little bit. Okay. Um, I should probably talk a little more about technique because uh, I mean, unless unless you want to talk more about you know storytelling, Stoker. Right? There were a couple other, a couple other uh, aspects of comic making I wanted to go through. Quite a lot, actually. Yeah, well, there's there's quite a lot of aspects to it. People uh, just do not. Uh, people who haven't done it sometimes do not realize just how much work comics really are. Yeah, yeah. And um, there, there's also one of the things. That, there's also advantages and disadvantages when it comes to uh, uh, doing it with a team instead of just doing it by yourself. <laughs> because, like, um, the advantage is I don't have to learn how to do a lot of things like drawing. Um, <laughs> but like, God, there's just so much that goes into it. Mm. Like Jonas has been learning how to, um, how to do uh 3d modeling in, oh. uh, in blender so that oh. he can do like backgrounds and props and stuff. Oh, 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 oh. I want to get into that, but not yet. I want to, I do want to <laughs> get into the blender stuff, but, um, but let me just talk about flats for a minute because that's been like my bread and butter lately. Um, <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, I'm more confident with things like with with secondary aspects of comic making, like inking, flats, and shading, than I am with pencils. That's why you know we have the team now on Penny, um, and I've also been branching out doing flatting on other uh, other comics. Um, Let's see here. What have I got? Um, here we go. Actually, let me just uh, let me do this. Uh, Rick, I want to pull up an old page of Skin Changer. Okay, like page two. Do you mind? That's fine. Okay. So I'm loading up uh, page two um, of Rick's Haven Celestia comic, Skin Changer. Um, and here, 
right over here. Actually, let me go full frame again so everybody can see it. There we go. Uh, over here in the color section, I have a palette loaded for this exact comic. Um, and I'm going to do some quick flats on this frame right here. Starring, it has a pronounced Goja. Go, go. Goja. Goja, okay. Um, Goza or the Goza you're in. Yeah. <laughs> so, a cool thing about CSP, another, well, another cool thing, is that it can have a thing called a reference layer. Um, a reference layer isn't its own type of layer. It's a property of a layer. You set it in the layer palette. You just, there's a little lighthouse icon. You click it. Now, this layer becomes referential. Uh, other tools uh, will respect it if the, uh, if the toggle is set properly. Um, it's something you have to go through the settings set for each inst each instance of each tool, whether or not it respects the lines of the reference layer. But it makes flatting a lot easier. So let me pull up Goja's um, reference here. Give me one second. Put it in the subview window. There we go. The window. Uh, Sub-window. There we are. <laughs> so, I happen to have Goja's uh, colors sampled along with Rackham's and everyone else's in this comic um, in this handy little side palette thing. But I can also eyedropper them from uh, from the sub view window, and then I can do this. You know, easy peasy. Now, there are a couple different ways to do this. Um, it's again, this is one of those areas where vector layers come in really handy because you can set it to see because the lines are mathematical, they only exist as like as as objects with control points. And then the you know and, and then the actual line is drawn sort of on top of that. So you can tell it to respect the center of the lines and it'll make um uh, shading a lot easier. In this case, since the line happens to be raster, I can still use the reference layer to um, do the coloring. Uh, I can tell it to close gaps as needed, you know, because Rick's art, like anyone's, has tiny little gaps in there. Um, it's very, very difficult to not do inking without gaps. That's true. That is absolutely true. Now, if, if, um, they, if they had, like, a tool that would allow you to ink and then automatically close the gaps. That would be interesting, but also probably not very useful because uh, actually doing the fills with the uh, gap detector that uh, CSP has is easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, since uh, Goja has some areas here that are not defined by inking lines, but rather just by transitions, I will... I made this tool called Color Boundary, which has no anti-aliasing, and I will use it to basically draw in the transition points right here as such. And the entire process is like this. It's just a lot of a lot of this, and essentially it's a matter of modifying tools as needed to improve your uh, your workflow. The, the The goal here is to make it as automated and quick as possible without it looking sloppy, um, because the more you can do this pro this process in you know in a short period of time, the more pages you can do total, and that means you know um, the uh, the more you can crank out uh, per per hour. And um, let me just uh, it's hard to talk while doing this. Um, <laughs> there. There's Goja's face. And it's just, it's this over and over again. Um, I've gotten to the point where flatting a comic page takes me about, <laughs> about a day, <laughs> which is probably not as fast as it could be. But again, this is a learning process. It's not only a learning process just in terms of the entire process, but you also have to learn every artist's vocabulary of line. You get really up close and you notice lots of little things that you need to learn to, uh, to adapt to, you know, um, and there will always be little greebles and you know missed areas, which is why you have another handy tool called the garbage cleaner. I love this one. This one, it's so cool. You, um, you, you again, you have to set it to refer to the correct layers. In this case, I'm having it refer to both 
the fill layer, you know, the flats layer and the inking layer. But basically you just go whoosh, and then it just it detects and cleans up um little areas like this. Where, you know, like like right here, like watch like boop. Uh, in that case it didn't work. Um <laughs> it has a limit in terms of size. Like some of these simply can't, uh, you know, some of these are simply too big for it to notice. But basically, here, here we go, here we go. And again, it didn't work. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, here, let me make it, let me make it smaller and I can demonstrate how this, uh, there, see, there you go. Stuff like that. Um, just fun little things that CSP has devised to uh, make your life as a flatter easier, if that's what you want to do. Um, let's see. What's next? What's next? What's next? If you have a, actually here, let me go back to Penny for a minute. Um, ah, shoot. Hang on one second. Oh no. Okay, there we go. Let's go back to Penny for a second. Penny is a character with gradients. Um, I kind of regret doing this <laughs> in retrospect, but um, that's okay. I'll just show you how I do it. I have a separate palette for Penny. I'm going to flat her real quick. Well, trying to, hold on a second. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Simon says, Jonas Channeling Bob Ross. Now, uh, make your, uh, we're going to put some almighty trees here, and, uh, the, you know, everything's going to be real calm and happy. Um, am, I, am, I, am, I, am, I, am I dominating the conversation too much? Too? I, I don't want to, like, Yeah, too, Jonas Jews. Yeah. No, I was actually, uh, <laughs> I actually had to go AFK because I got a phone call because no one can leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just put it on uh, airplane for this whole thing. I, Solution I, to I, that is to uh, live your life so that nobody ever wants to call you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. I'm too lovable. <gasps> <laughs> um, what were we talking about? Uh, flatting at the moment, but I mean, if you have something else you wanted to... Uh... Um, I don't know. Does anyone have any specific questions about the comics in general or Penny in, in particular or uh, any of Rick's comics for that matter? Like, I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess this is Rick Con, not Stoker Con. I know. I've, I, that's why I asked if, like, I need to be right, BRB a little second. Okay. Oh, okay. Now it is Stoker Con. Yeah. <laughs> Stoker and Jonas Con. Thank you. Stokon. Sorry. Okay. What? All right, here it is. Um, but yeah, uh, consider the floor open to uh, to questions at this moment. Though, don't expect the floor to say much. It doesn't have a mouth. <laughs> unless it's like an unless it's like an SCP or something. Yeah, you secure, contain floor, floor mouth. Floor mouth. That's that, my favorite SCP. Wasn't that an enemy in Zelda? Anyway. Um, <laughs> Please, someone stop us from talking about this shit. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is how we are on Twitch. <laughs> um, floor mouth. I don't know. What's your least favorite aspects of the Penny comic? <laughs> um, me or Stoker? <laughs> Let's have you go first, Jonas. <laughs> I want to hear. <laughs> okay. Sometimes, you know, this happened more when I was doing all of it rather than just some of it. But sometimes we'll get all the way to the end of a production line you know, without noticing some little greeble somewhere. Um, some little, you know, spot that's, like, it's small enough not to notice on um, casual perusal, but then once we've got the page up everywhere, someone will go, hey, you forgot, you know, one of them fingers or something, or, you know, the, the, the bag's the wrong color. And, like, even though, 
you, you know, I said, you know, we, we've, we've said, let go of perfect. My brain will just seize on it and go, no, you're getting no sleep until you fix this. <laughs> That's what my brain sounds like. Um, but... <laughs> And then sometimes, sometimes, even before they're up, uh, Stoker, being the pain in the ass that he is, <laughs> will be like, hey, uh, you know how this thing is inked and uh, colored and everything? There's something I just noticed that wasn't apparent to me in the sketch version. <laughs> this is why I drink so much coffee. But um... You could have just left that off with, like, this is why I drink so much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um... But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's my, uh, biggest thing. And I don't, I don't blame the fans for that. They're only pointing out what should be obvious, which is why, you know, these days we go through a kind of like an informal quality checking process where when a page is done, we run it past the team and the team. Is and I have learned, I have learned that I absolutely have to do that on, uh, <laughs> on my PC, not on, uh. <laughs> Yeah, you can't. Not do on my on, phone, which I mobile. have been guilty of doing more than once. <sighs> but uh, yeah, it's 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 a process, y'all. It's a process. <laughs> uh, as for me, what would I say my least favorite thing is? Um, uh, my least favorite thing about this entire thing overall so far has been uh, severely. Uh, underestimating how long this first chapter was going to take to tell. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, I'll just write this script and put a million things in it. We'll establish every character ever. <laughs> and set up all these these relationships. And, like, it's been... I mean, I... I I say it's been dragging on. If you actually read through the archive straight through from start to finish, like, this is like an hour's worth of reading, maybe probably less than that. Well, this is a, sorry, do you mind if I interject? Yeah, by all means. This is a peculiarity of the web comic format. When you read printed comics, everything, you know, you have the entire span of time of the narrative mm -hmm. to read at your own pace. You know, it's like, like a book. Um, but the funny thing about web comics is since they're generally released a page at a time, this is mostly how it's done over here. You know, in the East, you know, with like manga, you get online releases where it's 30 pages and then nothing for a month, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but, you know, because uh, American web comics kind of go like, you know, a page a week or a couple pages a week, um, you know, it's not a big deal if it's just, you know, slice of life, haha, funny paper stuff. But if it's a story, especially a story with dramatic tension, it can get, in a way, almost, almost uncomfortable. Because, you know, like, I'm trying to give an example. Um, you know, like the... Uncomfortable is not the right word because I don't want it to sound like I'm disparaging the, the medium or any particular artists. Um, but there's a certain tension that forms. Like I'm trying to think of what was a what was a really long arc in House Pets. Uh, well, I mean the current one. Um, it's been going on for like what over a year now in in our time. But as it unfolds in the comic, it's you know it's. It's uh, a lot. Uh, it's 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 a much more real time span, you know, um, just stuff like that. You know, it's 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 a quirk of the medium, and like Stoker said, Penny's. Uh, it's been less than a day for Penny. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's true, and it's been like what had uh, over uh, a while. Yeah, it's been like almost two years in our time. Yeah, I mean that's just how it is. You know, I mean, I often think about like how the old you know the, the folks at like marvel comics were able to crank out these stories you know like like 30 pages in a week you know God, that's unthinkable yeah, to me without any without any digital assistance um it just it just blows my mind i guess you basically just have to give up on having any other life if you do it that way <laughs> yeah well i mean it it, it depends you know people th there there is you're, you're right in that there is always going to be a degree of sacrifice you know i mean i've been able to do this because i've been cooped up in my apartment for two years um 
<clears throat> Don't hold back, Jonas. Tell us how you really feel. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of, I mean, part of it's efficiency, you know, like tools like CSP and other tools, you know, like, uh, like the various websites I mentioned earlier, or, you know, part of it's distribution among staff, part of it's your business and work models. And part of it's just fundamentally, how much time do you want to devote to this? How much, you know, how much, I was gonna say, how much does this matter to you? But like, that's, that might not be the way to put it because, you know, you can have something matter a lot to you and not necessarily want to just like, you know, like break yourself trying to get it done in a hurry. Um, so that's, uh, that's all I got. Um, <laughs> there were Did more that... questions. Oh yeah. yeah like... There's, there's quite a few more questions. I think. Oh, oh okay. Up, uh... What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? Uh, here's a good one. When you make new characters for your comics, do you consider how hard it will be to draw them repeatedly? I don't think uh, we even thought about that with Penny herself. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know, Rick, do you want to do you have anything uh, for this one? I mean, sometimes I think about that, but I usually like to... Uh, I usually trend toward simpler to draw characters anyway because I'm usually very tired all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mood. Fair. But at the same time, it's like sometimes I, oh, this character is going to have spots every single time. <laughs> every <laughs> single time I do that. So, like, when uh, it came around for uh, Lois and I decided, hey, I'm going to have a bobcat in this, or Lynx, whichever <laughs> one it was, in this comic now, <laughs> he's going to have spots. Well, part of the thing with uh, her is that uh, I have to basically figure out how I'm going to draw the spots every single time, even if they're not they're not like exactly the same. If I like do a different pattern of the spots, it's going to come out differently. So I basically need to needed to come up with and memorize a way of uh, drawing the spots so that they sort of appear consistent from a distance mm. and. That was we not something I was considering when I decided to make her. <laughs> I think we have that issue with Tammy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I've... Uh, in, in my head canon, Tammy just has... Uh, you know, if anyone ever asks, I'm just going to be like, yeah, Tammy has a case of wandering spots. It's a genetic condition. <laughs> I mean, does it matter to the narrative if they're consistent? <laughs> Yes, Jonas. This oh, has no. to be a completely immersive world. <laughs> uh, when I like drew Jada, I just didn't care about where his spots are placed exactly. Nobody's going to notice that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and if anyone does, you can always just zap them with your eye beams. The only yeah, thing, that, the thing that made Jada's spots consistent was that I just drew them with the uh, broad end of a brush at that time. So and that was what made Jada's spots look like Jada's spots. I think if the things like character details are key to the narrative, like, oh, you know, so-and-so's got, like, you know, this one ringle's got, you know, three earrings on one side, and one of them's like a, a, a little grenade you can pull and, you know, throw it and explode. <laughs> um, you know, the, <laughs> then, you know, then, yeah, you're going to want to make sure said ringle has the correct number of earrings in you know, the pre-explodey panel and then the post-explodey panel. But I mean, you know, other than that, it's like, does it matter? Ah, uh, yes, the famous wrangle grenades. That's totally my OC. Rick, that's my OC now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, y you, there are some things where, you know, you you've probably, you if you're watching my stream, you've noticed that I've been doing these little gradient fills on Penny. These are very simplified gradients you know, where I wanted to give her like Fennec kind of coloring and it went through a couple different uh, iterations. And this is, this is the fastest version I've come up with where I have a penny gradient. Actually I have like four penny gradients and I just create fills using quick mask and then just drop them in there. This is something you can do. Uh, and a lot of the time you just have to focus on simplifying 
to the point that it doesn't, where it's sort of subconscious and not really noticeable. And then anyone who notices it, uh, well, you know, they, they, they can just, they can just shut up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're like anyone who notices it, you just say, no, you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> get, get the neural eyes. Pew. Um, what was your favorite comic panel to draw that was a real pain in the butt? Uh, all of them for me. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't know, Rick. Do you have any, uh, anyone for that? Well, I remember one that was a pain in the butt that's not one of my favorite panels. <laughs> Which but one might that be? That would be, uh, the wide shot of, uh, King and Bailey's wedding scene. Oh, that was a lot of characters. Was it was. Um, let's see. Frederick asks, that's a quick mask you're doing with the red areas. Right, that is correct. That is a quick mask. Quick masks are a feature in not just CSP, but a number of programs where you draw a region and then have it become a selection. It's very handy, especially if you're doing little little sliced out zones uh, for things like shading and whatnot. Um, definitely worth... Um, there's a lot to it, so a lot to selections and masking. Uh, in this or any program. So I recommend if you want to learn more about it, check your local library. Uh, no, um, just check YouTube. Um, there are a lot of great tutorials on this stuff. Don't take my word for it. But I'm <laughs> thumb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I miss reading Rainbow. Um, let's see. Are you okay with people wanting to commission non-canon penny content from you? It, it, I mean, if I don't want to do something, I'll just say no. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, Jonas is one of those people who's not afraid to say no. Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of like, by and large, I don't give a shit, but, you know, it's more <laughs> like... Well, it's it for me. It's more like okay, do I do I want to do this? You know, is this something I want to spend my time? On? It's not that I, it's not that I'm devaluating anyone's you know whims or whatnot. But like again, this is a matter of time allocation for me. You know, people don't realize that like a big part of these kinds of decisions is okay. This is going to be X number of hours. Do I want to commit to it? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. And uh, as far as uh, as far as my perspective is concerned, um, since they're my babies, um, I don't mind if things get a little bit uh, silly and out of character. It's just like if things get too far out into left field, I'll say no. Like if you want, uh, I don't know, to make Penny a serial killer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Didn't we draw that? Okay, yep. yes, we did draw something like that, yes. So maybe that's not the best example, but... <laughs> it's the, it's the way is... that you depicted her as a serial killer that yeah. matters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, the point is, uh, how out of character is it, and does it make us laugh? <laughs> I mean... I mean in general, when, you know, because obviously people have commissions you know, um, or gotten Patreon rewards for make of, like, the House Pets characters, like, there's there's a degree of read the room at play. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, does, you know, you know, look at, look at the artist's past body of work. Ask yourself, okay, have they ever done anything like this before? You know, doesn't that, is that indicative of maybe whether or not it's an appropriate request. Does it fit with the confines of the world? Is it funny? Is it unique? You know, I mean, these are the questions the artist is going to ask. So these are the questions you have to ask when you, before you ask the artist. Does that That's make sense? deep, man. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, feel free to chime in here, Rick, if you want. Like, I mean, I've been requested a bunch of stuff that, uh, I wouldn't actually draw with House Pets characters. Like, one of them definitely popped up in the uh, <laughs> the commission requests. <laughs> but I don't, like, begrudge anybody for asking that. It's like, sure, go ahead, ask that. Think that if you want. Commission somebody else to do it. I don't care. <laughs> exactly. You know, there's, there's, there's a bazillion artists out there these days. Just hit one of them up. Um, it's true. <laughs> 
Um, let's see. Any other questions? Are we caught up on the on the questions? Okay. Maybe. Um, Until some more questions emerge. All right. Let's see. Was there anything? from their cocoons? There's beautiful butterflies. Talk to them. Talked about we talked about inking, flying stream lettering. Um, we talked about final consistency checking already. I was going to save that for last, but um, we pretty much covered it. We covered it a couple times. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think about what I could say about shading. Um, shading. Uh, I don't know how Rick does it. Um, but the way I do it is with correction layers, which tends to make the file a little bit uh, bloaty, but um, it allows for finer control over effects. Um, correction layers are another innovation um, that are relatively new. Photoshop has had them for a while. Uh, CSP has them, and I think it has a better implementation of them, where basically it's, uh, it's got a binary mask, you know, um, and the mask controls the amount of change that's overlaid on the uh, on on the the base pixels. Like here, I've got one layer that uh, just drops the uh, brightness in selective regions, which I've been painting to make Penny's uh, shimmery hair. And then here, I've got a brightness one for the highlights. Just stuff like that. Um, and you can do a lot with these things. With these things, it's true. Can, you can kind of cheat. Let me show you a little, a fun little thing I like to do. Um, let me uh, put all these in there. So this is my thing, and it's a relatively recent thing. It's uh, it's a tone curve. Tone curves are a type of correction layer um, where you can see the entire uh, body of the colors, uh, you know, all the channels, red, right? green, and blue, as a... Uh, as a histogram, which is sort of like a, like a, like a plot, like, like a graphical breakdown. Um, you know, if you've, if you've done like algebra and stuff, it's uh, kind of a graph and then you can modify the curve and you can get these neat little effects. Like watch this. Like, let's say, let's say I wanted to make, make it look like Penny was kind of like in a sunset. So I would drop some of the, uh, I drop some of the uh, yellow tone. Oh no, I drop some of the blue tones. I should say, and um, there's some of the red in the low end, and you get this nice kind of like kind of look here. And I will employ this very subtly because too much it'll look like a washed out photo or something. But you can get some really nice effects with this. Um, I'm paying course, attention sometimes. here because I've only ever used adjustment layers. Oh yeah, <laughs> I've poked around at correction layers a few times. I just didn't get it. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Again, this is my thing because I come from um, like I like I, I did this a lot with photos in like Lightroom. When I was at this period where I wanted to be a photographer, so I was experimenting with correction layers. Uh, you know, non-destructive alterations in uh, Photoshop and Lightroom, and like I love this kind of look. I love this sort of faded look. And you can do a lot in terms of like creating an ambiance. Like let's let's see, I boosted the blue and cut out the red, and you almost you, it it can get ugly. You know, it can get kind of like uh, garish and and weird looking if the curves get too far. But like you can see how like. It can also be interesting, you know, like that, like, you know, you could put a character in this in a shady area that looks like that looks like you know there there maybe like it's like a cheap way of like making like bounce light from like grass or leaves. It's kind of greenish stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one option. There's also um, you know there's also like gradient maps, which are definitely more. Uh, more intense you know this is this is just remapping the entire uh, you know dropping out all the colors remapping the brightness to a to a, a preset uh, series of colors i guess it's kind of like a transform i guess you call it uh so this is also an option and then i just vary the opacity to get this this is a bit more in your face you know 
Um, but these are all tools you can use. Um, another one that I'm fond of is color balance. Although this, I, I've never, I haven't really gotten great results with this. You know, you, when you do a color balance correction layer, you can individually change some of the channels, like push the, uh, you know, like push the cyan or red balance. It's a more subtle effect, um, like almost too subtle for me. Uh, but it's interesting, you know. And again, these are all simply tools, methods of achieving the end result. What is the end result? You got to figure that out for yourself. Decide what it is, and then find the uh, you know the best uh, route to it. And again, this stuff is all back end. Nobody, you know, nobody waiting for the commission is aware of any of this, uh, unless you know, unless you point it out. And um, it's it's something that you know, like again all of this is a time cost all these little adjustments iterations and trials are you know equal more more tangent time the best thing to do is just like like once you have a consistent workflow like you know like what i would do is now that i've got correction layers to make her shadow and highlights i would copy and paste those to another frame and then paint it again for the next you know for the next frame the next frame the next frame and so on and so on <laughs> um and you know you can also just use like multiply layers or dodge or whatever. There's a bazillion choices out there. Just go with whatever works for you. You'll find something. Um, I don't know, Rick, you got anything uh, to add to that? Or... No, I think you covered it. Cool, cool. Now I want to talk about 3D. Like for oh God. my sh my shading is usually like a combination of uh, using the hard light adjustment layer uh, oh, okay. and just using uh, dark colors on top of that because even though it's hard light, it will darken and uh, also change the color because if you use cool colors on shadows from most things or sometimes you want warm shadows, but uh, whatever that is, it uh, gives uh, color to the shadows instead of just like using gray like. People just starting out with doing this sort of thing just tend to say, oh, shadows are dark, dark is black, add more black here. No, you don't want to do that. You want... <laughs> yeah. You want it to pop a little more than that. Yeah. In general, shadows are a color. I mean, unless you have, like, the... I mean, even space is a color, I believe. Like, I think, like... The background color of the universe is sort of like green, but um, but in general things will look more realistic if you don't have like like Rick said if you don't have just flat black shadows you can get away with that you know you got you got there are plenty of artists like Mike Mignola who do flat black shadows and do it just fine but if you want to impart that sense of realism then you usually want to have a little bit of hue in your shadows you know there's no absolute black no absolute white everything is is. Uh, uh, a rainbow shades. Um, let's see. Oh, right, three D. Um, <laughs> here, hold on. Let me um, let me just switch programs. So, another innovation in Clip Studio Paint is that it allows for three D objects as assets. Let me dig something up. So. You've got these sort of like posable figures, and if you're coming from a 3D background, you will find that the controls are a little rudimentary. Um, but this is a thing you can do. Look, look at him jump! Look at him jump! He's so happy! Um, anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and they've improved on this uh, substantially. You can, you can now you can put in primitives in the same... Um, in the same, damn it, hang on. In in the same scene and and have them kind of like exist in the same uh, reality. And then one thing you can do, which Rick has been using to great effect in uh, in his comics, is you can do this thing called convert two lines and tones. It's not perfect in terms of workflow, but essentially it strips out the. Uh, it, it it strips out the 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 3D data and renders them as vectors or rasters depending on what you like. Um, and it's not it's not perfect, but it's pretty damn good for what it does. It's pretty damn good considering it's AI. And now these are manip manipulable um, lines that I can I can play around with. 
um, because it's you know interpolating, you get some of these jaggies. But again, if it's just background stuff, you won't even notice. You know, this is all over. Like if you look at especially at the um, the A and H backgrounds recently, and the um, the the Haven Celestia backgrounds, you can see this to great effect. Um, Let's see. Not so much on this page, but uh, if you look at the other pages, um, you can see plenty of examples of this. And if you know, and Clip Studio Paint has a wide variety of assets that you can download um, from their online store. But if you can't find exactly what you need, what you gotta do is make it. So I've been learning Blender. <laughs> I, I've actually been learning Blender for about two years on and off, but I kind of gave up for a while because it's this like steep cliff for an art brain. And for a long time, I was just kind of like, I can't do this. But um, recently, because of the need for it in Penny, um, I've been picking it up again. So let me let me just show you the basic kind of workflow for that real quick. Let me just put it up on my stage here. There we go. Put CSP away for a second. So here is it. Is it showing up? Here is a, uh, a simple little bar stool I created for an upcoming penny scene. Uh, it's just a bunch of cylinders. Um, get, getting good at Blender and 3D in general is a whole other tangent. Like it's, it's a very large, different tangent that you know needs to be covered. The, the, there are in there are innumerate um, YouTube videos on this. Just just Google like Blender for beginners. You'll find lots of great stuff. Anyway, I made I modeled the bar stool. I exported it as an OBJ file, which is a standard 3D interchange format, and then I I go back to. Uh, to Clip Studio Paint. And when I'm in the scene I want to drop it into, I do File, Import, um, 3D Data, and then I go through my hideously uh, complicated projects folder, which I really need to take a weekend and organize. <laughs> um, there it is, Barstool. And voila! It's a custom. It's it, it's a custom three D object that I can manipulate on planes, angle, pose, blah 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 blah, and it's cool. <laughs> My that whole, is cool, Jonas. It really is. I mean, this is this this is this is really a step forward in my opinion. And um, my hope, I'm still kind of a noob with Blender. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I don't know. A lot, a lot, a lot. Um, but I have already begun. Actually, let me. Stokes, do you mind if I show him the shop? Oh yeah, it's by not, all means. I mean, everybody knows that we're um, getting into the shop soon right. anyway. So this is from an up. Let me find the shop one second. This is from an upcoming um, Penny scene. Actually, the next scene where she enters the mysterious uh, uh, shop, which I had to pretty much design from scratch. Well, not design. Okay, uh, that that's that's not true. Someone else did the uh, our our background layout person did the uh, the floor plan for the shop, but. Um, I've had to essentially kind of build it up in 3D. Um, and let me find that model. Where's the shop? There's the shop. Okay. Oh, whoops. Hang on. Is it, is it showing up in the... Okay, there it is. Yeah. So, so you can see, basically, this is the beginning of... Hold on. Let me switch to rendered. Let's see if this kills my processor. Yeah, I'd cut my processor. There we go. Um, this is the rendered version of the shop where um, I've got I've got like the rudimentary version of the lighting and the beginnings of like there's the bar stool right down there, um, the countertop, the display cases, the back room here with uh, you know with the boxes and the, uh, the ah, ah. And, and and like you know like the dressing room there'll be a curtain right here I. Model those little hooks right there, and so on and so forth, all because you know you uh, you know I we didn't quite have what we needed on the asset store. I knew that you know like we'd probably have to just make this happen. So uh, so I did. 
This is very different from 2D. If you're coming from a 2D background, it, it's it's a lot of work, but it's absolutely, absolutely worth it. I feel like every artist should at least get their toes wet with this sort of thing because it really forces you to think about things differently. Um, and once the assets have been made, you know, you can, you can use them as much as you want after that. That is correct. Basically, That's the real advantage. <laughs> yeah. I can, um, I can, you know, it, well, that and like, like you can um, do things like entire rows of lockers or, you know, randomized landscapes with trees dotting, you know, trees and rocks and whatnot without really thinking about it because a lot of the stuff is procedurally generated. And that takes a goodly, you know, in, in tandem with CSP, that takes a goodly amount of pressure off of the background artist, which is good because not every, you know, not everyone on the Penny team is always available to do everything. You know? Yeah, we, we all wear many hats. I've even uh, flatted a few times. Not, not very often, but a few times, which is yeah. definitely outside my wheelhouse. <laughs> so these are all things that are worth being aware of, you know, um, worth studying and, and integrating into your skill set. All of this also applies in other areas. You know, I've been, um, I've been using this to do uh, other kinds of gigs too, and it's really cool. Uh, Frederick asks, how long does it take you to make something like that stool? Um, the stool, I don't know. How long did the stool take me? Stokes? a couple days. I, I guess I like, you know was, better than I would. Wasn't I like, yeah, I, yeah. Um, I think if I just sat down and did it continuously, it might take me like a couple hours, but I'm very slow. I'm very slow. I'm just beginning with blender. Um, you know, when you're, uh, when, when you're doing this stuff for like a career, you can just, I've seen people bang it out in like an hour or less stuff like this, you know, and I'm not even bothered with things like textures, you know, there's, if you're really doing it properly, it can be involved. It can be, you know, projects can be months, years, eons. Um, <laughs> I, was I saw I it. saw some uh, a workflow of somebody I think who was uh, creating build buildings for I think uh, Cities XL, oh. and he said, "Okay, like here's here's how we make one of the buildings. It's like oh, okay, here's a box, box, uh, add a texture to it, texture, uh, do a height map, height map, whoop, and it was basically done at that point." <laughs> oh. Yeah, I mean, some people, some people, this is just like, they just live and breathe this stuff. And um, it just, it blows my mind. Um, I know a guy who worked on Zootopia and then worked at Blizzard. And um, he just, he's been banging out this complicated scene in Unreal. And it just, it's unreal. It's unreal. Um, yeah, it's unreal. <laughs> I was waiting for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, I've been talking a lot. Um Wait, she asks, Rick, will Peanut and Taro ever have a litter of probably the cutest pups ever? People keep asking that. <laughs> <laughs> everyone just really wants uh everyone just really wants them uh them peanut butter puppies. <laughs> I don't know. That sounds horrible when I say it that just way. Just call them the uh, peanut butter cups. Peanut the butter peanut butter cups. Peanut butter cups. <laughs> the peanut butter pups? Yes. P yeah, peanut butter puffs sound like like a toy line from the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> they do actually. <laughs> God, I can see like the intro and the theme song. You're like peanut butter puffs, peanut butter puffs. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think that might be all I've got. Well, okay, no, there's there's other stuff I could talk about too. But are there any more questions for us or Rick or whatever? Anybody? Anyone? I'm also willing to answer questions. Why well, I said Stoker or Raker. Oh. Blaze Cast asks, so I have a question. As someone who is just getting back into art and digital art at the same time, have you ever had a hard time translating what's in your mind's eye and what your, what your hand is actually drawing? I know I have a hard time with that. Absolutely. Pretty much with every drawing. 
I have a hard time with that too. That's why I make Jonas do it. I mean, well, you're, you're never really going to be able to do that like perfectly because even if you're like picturing something exactly in your mind's eye, uh, the human brain really only has like the uh, ability to uh, put attention onto a very tiny spot at, a, at any given time. Yeah. So, like, even if you're, like, picturing everything perfectly inside your mind, you're not actually grasping, like, all the proportions between everything. And that just, like, takes practice to figure out how uh, the space between everything works. Like, so, like, even if I know exactly how Bailey looks, I've dr drawn her, like, ten million times, I still need to sketch her out so that I know where all the proportions are going to go. <laughs> yeah, if you try to draw Bailey uh, completely from, you know, like, <laughs> from memory and without doing any of that, she's gonna, I mean, Sorry. she may be recognizable as Bailey, but she's probably gonna look weird. <laughs> uh, if you see, uh, if you saw any of the stuff that I did, like, during the draw games that we did on Jackbox or with uh, Gardic Phone, when I'm doing that without any sketches... Uh, I tend to, like, fall back on certain just draw drawing patterns because I'm trying to mm -hmm. do it uh, without knowing what the proportions are beforehand, and it will get wonky. It doesn't look nearly as good as when I have a sketch layer <laughs> to work, <laughs> work from. Yeah. This does kind of, again, fall under the category of let go of perfect, you know, which is just good life advice, but it's kind of crucial with your art. It's not going to look like the way it should in your head because it, it, even what you see in your head isn't really the way you see it in your head. Um, if you have to, you know, practice muscle memory, uh, you know, use, use model sheets, whatever, but, you know, accept that to some degree, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to, it's going to be a, uh, kind of a, kind of a trip, kind of a journey there. I attempted to draw Bailey. It's going to be a journey, so don't stop believing. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's not bad. Yeah, thank you. But it's thank also you, very sketchy. Like, if yeah, you tried to not... do that ink immediately, that probably even wouldn't look uh, as good as that. Because when you're doing, like, a sketch layer, it's okay if some of the lines are fuzzy or slightly out of place, because mm -hmm. they're not supposed to be final. They're, they're just to be a guide so that you know how far away the cheek is from the eye, how far away the eye is from the nose, things like that. <laughs> that makes sense. Men's house did the reason why Jill sandwich is so funny ever get answered. Hmm. Um, uh, mitts. Yeah, mitts. Yes. <laughs> That's a deep cut, oh. son. Uh, <laughs> you missed it. It went right past you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a deep cut. I say that's a deep cut, son. <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw that tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Lansdowne asked you a fix to Nice boy, but it doesn't know the lore. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Um, Dan Lenz asked, do you have a fixed duration slash conclusion in mind for Penny, or we'll keep going until you run out of stories? That's one for Stoker. Uh, okay, so I do actually have a full arc uh, with an ending planned for Penny. Uh, how long it takes to get there, and how much of it changes uh, as we go through the journey is... Uh... <laughs> anyone's guess even i don't know for sure there are things that i know definitely uh will not change throughout the arc and there's a few things that might and there's little details here and there that i don't know for sure yet um but i do have an ending in mind god only knows how long you'll take to get us there because we're not even done with chapter one yet it's gonna be like evangelion everyone explodes and screams and turns into orange juice Jonas, you spoiled <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Spoiled the 1997 uh, anime. No, um, I was saying you spoiled Penny. That was the joke. That was the joke, son. Oh, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> uh, I do not do a good foghorn like <laughs> Let's see, Miss asks, do you, any of you artists do physical media work in your history? Um, yeah. Not very good at it. I mean, when I started, uh, it was just basically pencil on paper. That's physical media. Yeah. And then I did, uh, I physically inked house pets for a couple of years, and that was very instructive on how to actually do that well. Yeah. Um, Naked Penny is going to be in the next One Piece. Yes. <laughs> uh. <laughs> what was that, Jonas? No, I'm just. <laughs> um, were you were you horrified at the thought of how long? What, you... what chapter are they up to now? One like, Piece. Yeah, it's like fuck. Yeah, like, I know. It's... Let's see, chapter. Okay, it's chapter one thousand forty four. Yeah, Penny's not going to go that long. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know if chapters. any comic has ever gone that long. <laughs> I don't know how many chapters there are going to be yet. I actually uh, have someone I'm I'm talking with uh, in terms of uh, scripting and plotting, a sort of uh, another assistant. I think, um, uh, action comics only hit like issue one thousand a couple years ago. <laughs> God. God, really? That is so. One Piece has has more issues than the action comics, is what you're telling. Uh, it's about to, I think. <laughs> I cannot even with that. <laughs> I can't even with it because Fairly it's too scary. odd. Yeah. Um. Let's see. I did want to talk a little bit about external hardware support for this kind of stuff because, you know, aside from all the digital tools, there are also some other kinds of nifty things you can get. Let me go over to uh, my browser window real quick. So this is just a quick overview. This isn't everything. This isn't comprehensive, but these are some cool things you can you can get. Um, the people who make Clip Studio make Clip Studio TabMate. I've got one of these. It's super, super, super handy. Um, the old version was USB. This version is Bluetooth. It's like, it's like, it's about the size of like, like a like a miniature remote control. You put you put it in your hand, and you you basically like, it lets you control with your left hand things like, um, you know, like 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 eyedroppering or you know zooming or whatnot. Um, you can pull up quick menus. It's not mandatory, but again, it speeds up your uh, it speeds up your game. So if you ever want to, if you don't mind dropping you know sixty bucks on one of these things, they're absolutely worth it. It's not the only thing you can you can use in that context. Like there's this tiny little Bluetooth controller called the Eight Bit Do. Um, there's a whole line of them. Let me find the one that I'm looking for. Um, I played around with this also for a while. It's 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 itty dinky. It's like it's this tiny little thing. Um, you know, they're, they're obviously they're made for like the switch or like emulators or whatnot, but it, you can repurpose the controls, um, using programs like joy to key, where basically it, it corresponds to hotkeys and CSP, and you can essentially use it as like a, a very similar kind of left hand auxiliary control for different aspects of the, uh, of the program. Um, that's something I played around with. I've, I've, I've tried a couple of these with little, little, little Bluetooth dealies. I also I actually tried using my Xbox controller at one point to um, to try and like handle things like Zoom, which didn't work very well. Also, one of the quirks about CSP is that its analog control is it doesn't correspond to like an analog stick, so it's capable of analog input, which you can use to just like swivel the canvas around, but it's unique to the program, so you can't just use like a regular uh, gamepad's analog stick. I, I, you know, if you can't tell, I'm real big on efficiency. So I've been, you know, I've been trying to find all these, find all these solutions. So I'm not, you know, you know, spending hours or not as many hours on this stuff. No substitute for hard work. Um, but it's but shortcuts are good. So um, 
let's see what else um uh csp has a samsung app um let me find it that turns the turns the uh samsung phone or, or tab or galaxy whatever into an auxiliary um like like it becomes like a second screen and then you can basically use it to like ha to manipulate some of your uh, on-screen controls that's an option um if you uh if you want to um put a little more money down you've got the loop deck which is this like it's it's hardware it's like it's 500 bucks it's super fancy and you can use it with a whole bunch of programs let me find a good picture of it um it's got a knob <laughs> It's got on-screen controls, and this is like the deluxe. I don't have this. I don't have this. Um, but this is yet another thing you can you can use with paint programs. Not just CSP, but any paint program or any media editing program or who knows. Um, but it's some seriously deluxe stuff. And again, th these are all like different time savers. You know, use what works well for you. And of course, if you're a gamer, you know about this one, the Stream Deck. I've always wanted one of these. It would probably be of less actual use to me, than, you know, than, than than I think it would. But look, it's so cool. It's command center. Um, but yeah, these are all things that are that can be repurposed for um, boosting your workflow, essentially. And uh, they're worth looking into. There's a bunch of other ones too, but um, those are the ones I know about. Um, so, yeah. And what else? Was, oh, oh the, <laughs> the last thing I wanted to talk about, um, well, the last thing I have to talk about, I'm, I'm sure Rick and Stokes have more, but the last thing I want to talk about is artist self-care. Because I absolutely had to learn this the hard way. Like, oh my God. Um... It's really easy when you're doing this stuff to get dialed completely into it. And then three hours have gone by and your hands cramped and you're just like, what happened? Um, and, uh, it happened. It's time for mandatory union break. <laughs> it's <laughs> not a mandatory <laughs> union break. Um, <laughs> basically you have to absolutely consciously engage your sense of self-care when you're an artist because there's nobody there you know unless you're unless you're working as part of a studio there's nobody there to tell you hey your, your fingers are gonna fall off okay stop that um <laughs> basically you know they're just i mean there, there are a lot of different things you can do but like a couple of really important ones just to avoid basic eye strain, there's the 20-20-20 rule, which is every 20 minutes, um, look at a point 20 feet away for 20 seconds. This is just so that you're not, your eyes aren't locked on the screen. It also helps to maybe blink a bit when you're doing this. Um, no, that's how the weeping angels Yeah, it's a good thing. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, pe you know, people might say, "Oh, uh, I don't." You know, how can you forget the blink? It's reflexive, but no, trust me, that can happen. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, basically, your eye muscles, you know, your your eye muscles will get fatigued, just like any other muscle. Um, your eyes will get dry, and you know, y y it'll just you know the 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 very often the pale light. Uh, yes, we're on Mike Weaver's Mount Gator sixty nine. Hello. Um, the pale light from the monitor, uh, can, uh, can kind of screw with your, uh, you know, your biological clock, especially over the period of hours and hours. Um, so remember to just blink and look away and just do this on a regular basis while you're working. So that's one thing. Um, another really, really important thing that you need to be aware of is that if you're drawing, uh, you run the risk of repetitive stress injury. Um, you can't totally avoid this, um, aside from just, you know, making sure to correctly distribute your, uh, your sections so that you're not doing like, you know, 
a hundred hours in a marathon or something. But um, things you can do are like there are various hand exercises. Google like ha- ha- like artist hand exercises on YouTube to uh, find out more about that. I could I could describe them, but it's better to just watch the video. You can see what it is. Basically, it's a lot of like like stretching your fingers funny ways and things like that. Um, it also just helps to get up, like with any desk job. You know, get up, walk around, stretch. You know, make sure that you don't lose circulation in your legs. Um, uh, what else? Uh, it's also good for your back. Um, and of course, hydrate. Can't emphasize this one enough. You need enough water. Your brain needs water. <laughs> and it's so easy. It's so easy to um, forget this. Mm. Speaking of, mm. um, yeah, yeah, I did it at exactly the same time too because you made me think of it. Yeah. Now I'm not going to tell people how much water they need. Uh, that varies per person depending on things like your age, gender, um, particular uh, health situation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the climate you're in, blah blah blah. But um, when uh, you know, it's 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 definitely. You don't want to neglect it. You want to, you, you know, the, there are there are water calculators, um, like daily index calculators online. Maybe plug your stats in and see what it says, or just ask your physician. And you know, ask keep, your doctor if water is right for you. <laughs> um, I have uh, this enormous uh, jug right under my desk. I call it the chug jug, um, and I just, I'm not perfect with this but I try to keep it consistent. You know, I try to at least every uh, few hours, if not every hour, I try to have a sip. And um, I don't know. Rick, do, do you have anything, uh, any other self-care pointers that I, that I didn't cover? Um, Uh, did, like there are uh, di- diagrams of hand stretching exercises that you can do. Oh yeah, let me see if I can dig some of those up. Hang on, exercises for artists. I could just put it up in the browser. Um, let's see here. Here we go. Here we go. Here's a good one. Um, one second, let me pull it up here. You know, like 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 this right here. You know, just just basic wrist uh, extension and flexion. You know, really simple stuff. It'll save you a lot of wear and tear. Um, and this you know this is good whether you're an artist or not. This is also good if you're just if you do a lot of typing or any kind of like repetitive manual labor. And anytime um, your hand feels stiff, it's a good idea to take a break and do that. <laughs> it's true. Or your eyes feel tired, or your head feels achy. Anything. Yeah. So, um... That's my whole list. Um... Oh, I forgot Bailey's little, uh... Little husky marks up here. You know, right? You would think, and when you're not doing anything yet, you know, you know, I mean, like like first thing in the morning, you feel all those aches and pains. For artists, it's not always obvious because we can be like hyper focused on a goal, on a visual goal, and like that can that that can almost drown out all the other uh, body signals sometimes. It's also, true. Sometimes your body signals are just unhelpful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's also true. There's hunger bots for the week. <laughs> Become cyborg, reject biology. Exactly. Just we need we need that. That's that's the big draw for for uh, you know the the singularity of the post human future. We'll all we'll be able to, we'll finally be able to draw all the stuff we want. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in an immor- I'll be in an immortal cyborg body, and I'll also have per- I'll also have perfect art skills. That's that's where it's at. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know. Any other uh, any other questions for any of us? <laughs> I've got a question. No. Oh, okay. Yes. I didn't really have a question. I was just going to make a joke oh. and be like, why? I was, I was getting all excited. Sorry. Um, does anyone want me to elaborate on any of the uh, different uh, techniques or uh, tools or CSP goodies that I mentioned before? You know, actually, I think I do have a question. And it's for Rick. Yes. So... You are famous at this point for having a lot of different creative projects uh, going on more or less concurrently. You juggle a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you recommend, or uh, how would you say you're able to pull that off, I guess is how I should, should ask it. How do you manage to juggle so many different uh, creative projects at once. Uh, singular obsession kind of helps. <laughs> <laughs> obsession with make, excuse me, obsession with making things. You mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that is a pretty big help. But I mean, like, even so. I mean, part of the reason that I do it that way is because uh, I can't really maintain one hundred percent perfect interest in everything that I'm doing at the same time. So. It always branches off into, uh, I want to do something for myself today. And that ends up spinning off into its own project anyway, because I'm like, I really like this. I want to see it go somewhere. And then I need to, since it becomes, you know, work, I sometimes need to, you know, take a break and do something for me. And that spins off into something else. And that's basically <laughs> how everything I've made started. <laughs> I mean, that makes total sense. I've heard it said by some people who do uh, multiple creative projects that uh, one of the one of the tricks is uh, having so many different creative projects going at any given time that uh, whenever you procrastinate, you can just procrastinate by doing a different creative project. And that that works sometimes. So. <laughs> oh no! I, I procrastinated like last month on uh, doing any of the uh, book three stuff that I needed to write for Haven Celestia by just r randomly working on Dogman stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> trying to think if I have any questions for you. Um, <clears throat> so, as I understand it, this is the last House Pets arc, uh, Hackraiser, and um, after this, it's going to be long. It's going to be occasional long form house pet stories. Yes. Do you have any specific ones you want to tell, or you, or, or do you think it's just going to be as they uh, occur to you? Uh, I just still have specific ones I want to tell. Like for instance, uh, there was an idea of uh, talking about uh, Briel's backstory. Oh, yeah. That I wanted to do. Uh, I definitely yeah. want to tell that one because I have several ideas for it, but I never actually managed to sit down and write it, and that would definitely be something that would benefit from being a uh, long-form comic. <laughs> hmm. That sounds like fun. And I also need to finish up uh, Bino and Duchess's story with the Good Old Dogs Club. <laughs> oh. The... I, wa I wasn't planning on just leaving that hanging. I was definitely gonna going somewhere with that. But, uh, again, every time I started it, it was like, uh, this is a very long story. I don't know if I can do this, but that's also going to be good for long-form comic. <laughs> well, there you go. So is your plan to, like, uh, release these when you're doing them in this format to uh, release whole stories all at once, or continue with the, you know, update a little bit of the time schedule like you're doing with Heckraiser. Uh, I mean, I plan to treat it basically like how I'm doing all my other comics at the same time, so. Oh, that makes sense. 
It just won't be like the super regular updates. It will be interleaved with any other comic projects I have going on at the same time more than it is currently because currently House Pets is coming out like three times faster than my other comics. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, people have grown rather accustomed to that, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, any other questions for Rick from the audience? Cab casks, are you all using CSP? Well, R Rick and I are. Stoker's uh, just using his charm. It's true. How dare you? I charm the pants <laughs> off people. It worked on Penny. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. I'm trying to think of questions that they would normally ask on like convention panels. <laughs> I admittedly kind of tune those out, so I don't actually know. Um, what were you saying, Jonas? I kind of tuned you out. Yeah, they, yeah you, I tuned those out too, but then I'm sitting up there and I'm like, what did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> the problem when you tune yourself out <laughs> what was i saying i wasn't listening um was someone taking notes <laughs> um let's see let me look at your different creations let's see if I creation think of anything in particular that i might want to ask Do, 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 do. do you have any more um, Haven Celestia comics planned after skin change? I do not have any particular in mind, but I basically plan on uh, just making another one at some point. <laughs> oh. I, I'm okay. mostly doing this as advertising for uh, the novels. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Cool. Like, yeah, I, that's... I definitely totally want it to be a good story. It's like, it's not just a cynical advertising thing, but uh, oh. people do pay attention to comics slightly more than they do books. And if I like, hey, these comics also have books, it might get a few more <laughs> eyeballs too. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, especially in the uh, especially in this particular fandom scene. Uh, visual media is king. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. It was Celestia, Pit Fighters, The New Age, Androids, Desert Angels. Um, do I have any? I'm trying to think of stuff I could ask you. Um. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's see. We have a couple of questions. Will Peanut get better at drawing? Asked by MDBJC. I don't see any reason that he should. <laughs> Peanut's plateaued. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> Mitz asks, what classic training do each of you have? Um, I took some art courses, not as many as people might think. Most of it's been self-training. <laughs> That's the same with me. I mean, I I started doing uh, majoring in art in college, and after a few classes, I was like, I don't really want to do it the way that the college does it. <laughs> yeah. Seems a, uh, a common issue, as yes. I have heard. That's why I switched yeah. to English, because... Uh, at least then I didn't have to put nearly as much effort in. <laughs> <laughs> that is completely fair and valid. College art professors tend to be kind of dogmatic about realism. And it's like, it's, you know, okay, that's a valid, that's an absolutely valid school of thought. You know, great things have been produced uh, in that arena. But yeah, it's, it's like, only like one of the things from, I did in college was uh, doing a life drawing course. And I would suggest that you do at least one of those. It's very right. instructive. <laughs> but uh yeah yeah absolutely i mean there, there's no substitute for 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 life drawing i actually need to do more of it um but 
you know, if you're if you're aiming to do things like web comics and have style stylization and caricature, then you're not going to want to stick to you know the perfect the perfect light and shadow and the, you know the. Uh, and, the, and the bowl of fruit and the, you know, the, the reclining nude and so on. And so forth. Just be, have that all that in the back of your head. Sure. But understand that that too is, you know, that school of thought is, is also one tool in an arsenal of many. Okay. But I want to see an entire comic about the still life bowl of fruit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure someone will do it. <laughs> Um, Remini Ravine says, I know this was more or less concluded with hearts and minds, but will we see more of just how Peanut, Taro, Grape, and Maxwell interacting with each other? Kind of a Gallifrax 2.0 without them splitting up. I think I've been, I've been toying with the idea of, uh, doing in a, uh, story with them all together like that. I'm not entirely sure at this moment what form that story will take, but that's definitely something that's on the table. Well, there is a, uh, a a wonderful little dangling plot thread that uh, you you tossed out there a while ago, where Peanut and Grape were like, "Hey, let's go on a date." <laughs> that has all kinds of possibilities. <laughs> Miller asks Rick, "You said earlier something about not wanting to do an HP commission, Jonas slash Rick. Where do you draw the line, especially as NSFW artists?" I'll let Rick go first. <laughs> uh, I like I put together and will not draw a list, but it's not exhaustive. Yeah, like there's just some things that you know just don't sit right with me, and it's like eh, I don't want to do that. But yeah. it's like not it's not usually going to be something that I'm going to consciously be able to summon out of thin air. It's like oh, I can tell you exactly where my lines are at any given moment because maybe like. Three weeks from now, I'd be like, "Hey, that was actually that's actually pretty interesting. I might want to do something with that." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Rick essentially summed it up. It's very similar to me. I I cannot enumerate every. I have a list. Um, I have a list. I can uh, you know I, I pull it up as needed. But um, you know, I I could not necessarily enumerate every single thing that would bother me. I mean, every now and then I find a new one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the internet is like, a wow, place. I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> this is revolting. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I'm trying to think of a recent example. Um, you know, it's just something, I mean, it's pretty, viscera will pretty consistently bother me. <laughs> you know, guts and. And, and splatter or whatnot. I mean, and, and again, you know, I when I was a kid, I you know, I I, I watch movies like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or whatever, and go, yeah, it's so gross. But you know, when you, as you get older, it kind of <laughs> it becomes like, do I want to draw this? No. Do I want to? Do I want to rent it? You know, and and watch it on a weekend with Stoker? Yeah, sure. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you included me in that. <laughs> But, also, um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is not a very gory movie. That's true. That's true. That's not a good example. The original but, uh, one is not very gory at all. No, you're you're right. But um, but yeah, mostly it's just it, it, there are broad moral and legal moral legal and you know like like strokes like that that you know one should always follow as guidelines. And then there's also like personal stuff, you know, from you know, my own. And then, and then it, there's also a small category of technical stuff where like, I don't want to draw it because it involves like, like complex juxtaposition of limbs or, or, you know, some other, you know, like, you know, like if someone wanted me to draw like, <laughs> like a, a, a perfect motorcycle with all the little doodads and wiggy woos, um, you know, I would probably say I would either say find someone else, um, or I would or I'd grab it off of Sketchfab or the asset store. Or if they really want me to, to do it all perfectly, I'm going to explain to them that I would probably have to model it in Blender, and it would probably be like upwards of a thousand at that point. And if they want to pay me to do that and then wait a while, I'll still say no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, because some things are worth more than money, such as your sanity. 
<laughs> there's some so, things money can't buy. For everything else, there's um, I don't know what is that visa. I don't remember. Um, can we see Penny and Calhart stuff? Yeah, sure. Oh God, sure. Calhart Finney. Sure, I'll do it. <laughs> Let's see, I got the the bean head. I don't really mind the Cal Art style that much. It doesn't bother I feel me. like I feel like people use that as a as a shorthand for like um <laughs> I don't know, bees. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it isn't the first time such geometric abbreviations of form have been used. I mean, my God. But, um... Uh, like, the, the thing that I always think when people say Cal Art style is, like, that bean mouth sort of yeah. thing, shape. Yeah, yeah, people complain about the bean mouth a lot. Which How I don't get, because I love when beans are in my mouth. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Let's see, how do I reduce the ears? Like, Karashad also likes it when beans are in his mouth. <laughs> See, <laughs> I guess it would be like, like, uh, yeah, sure, just like, yeah, um, and then the hair would be like, like that. My mother said not to put beans in my ears, <laughs> and then usually they're kind of like, <laughs> God. What have we done? Now you can see how that'd be very simple to animate because oh, yeah, absolutely. those are very, oh, yeah. very, very basic shapes uh, without necessarily being uh, looking crude. <laughs> we are the naked fans. All right, stop. <laughs> stop. You, just, you just stop right there. Sir. <laughs> um. <laughs> Oh, hello, kitty baby. <laughs> Where did you come from? You haven't been here this entire time. Hey, Stoker has a cat. Did y'all know that? Yes, Stoker does have a cat. <laughs> She's a very sweet little kitty, and she has a mustache. She has a mustache? Um, you know she has a mustache. I've shown you pictures. Well, I don't, like, actively, like, look at them and memorize her features, but... <laughs> Listen, she's she's a tuxedo cat. She's black and white, and she's mostly black on her face, and she has a little white mustache. Fair enough. How dare you not remember my child's mustache? <laughs> That's a sentence that people have people say in normal conversation, right? <laughs> That's a normal thing to say, right? Anyway, other que any other questions, folks? <laughs> Miss ask what kitty cat's name. Uh, Stoker's cat is named. Was it v Vanellope? Yes, Vanellope. She was named by the uh, the friend that I adopted her from. He said he gonna... named her. Huh? I thought you were going to say the friend that I adopted. Yes, my friend that I adopted. Um, he's like thirty, so it was a very weird process. No, um. <laughs> No, he really liked uh, Wreck-It Ralph, obviously. And uh, he said he named her Vanellope because she's so sweet. Aww. And she is. This is like one of the sweetest cats that has ever catted. And I'm looking through my Twitter right now because I know I've posted pictures of her at some point in the past. Let's see, in this style... Wow, I post some weird stuff on Twitter. Sorry, what, no, Jonas? No, no, what are you talking about? Um, Golly gee, how many times will Sally Acorn come up in my media tab? Um, <laughs> uh, Ray, the correct answer to that is, yeah, I probably could, but pay me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's one picture of her, but it doesn't give you a very good look at her face. Let me see if I can go back. You know, oh, the there's is. her little kitty like, face. I have this, like, 
these styles are like burned into my mind. And whenever someone suggests one, the practical, discrete part of me goes, no, I don't really have time for that. And then this other part of me goes, challenge accepted. There you go. This is this is her little kitty face. See, Rick is smart. Rick R- Rick stay, you know, Rick has a sort of like a suite, a range that he is comfortable with and develops. I'm just kind of like, I'll do anything. You know? (laughs) (laughs) Look at my kitty. Yes, your kitty is very cute. Also, I really enjoy this penny sketch. I kind of, (laughs) God, <laughs> want see it finished a bit All more. right, all right, sure. Um, oh, Rick, how uh, how long do you want to go? Uh, how long are you gonna <laughs> keep talking? I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can um, talk till the cows come home. I mean, well, basically, I mean, I'm I d- I'm here, you know, to support you. So, you know, whatever you, wh- whatever, whatever works for you. I'm here to force people to listen to me. Um, oh, you know what I need for this? I need like a like a single width line. The turnip pen, maybe. Yeah, there we go. Did you say that's, a turnip pen? That's what it's called. I didn't name it. It's called the turnip pen. Jonas, I don't know why. why did you name it that? I don't know. Maybe 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 like Japanese artists use it to, use it to draw turnips. Anyway, I was expecting um, you to be like maybe they used to draw with turnips. <laughs> I mean, you sharpen a root enough, you can probably dip it into the main coil. Anyway, um, I'm getting ever so slightly hoarse, so I will prob- probably, after this is done, I will, unless, unless you want to keep going, Rick, I'll probably call it a day. Um, <clears throat> How long have we been doing this, anyway? I haven't been uh, looking at the time. A couple hours. Penny for uh, at least two hours. hours. In Joan and Vasquez style, dear God. Yeah. I. God. Like one degree of separation from Joan and Vasquez in the Kevin Bacon game. Weird, isn't it? It is a little bit, yeah. I've always wanted to meet him, but at the same time, I I don't want to meet him, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Blaze Cat... Blaze, sorry, Blaze Cast asks, okay, this is a question for anyone. How would you feel including a, char- a character with a physical disability in one of your works? I know Rick has included an amputee, for example. I'm fine with it. I've, been, I've, I've actually been thinking about that uh, off and on because I, I, I'm, very, um, I'm very big on disability rights. Um, my, uh, my ex, uh, who I've mentioned once or twice on here, uh, was blind. Uh, still is. I mean, like, I mean, when I say was, I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> I mean, in the sense of, you know what I'm saying. And, uh, through I actually them, was blind. She still is blind, but she was blind too. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, through, through them, I learned, uh, so much <laughs> about, uh, dis- disability rights, the ADA, all kinds of like different, uh, uh, bullshit that disabled people get put through, and I'm big on the idea of representation. I just uh, haven't particularly figured out yet. Um, I, I I would want to have someone like that, some sort of representation in Penny. I just haven't come up with anything for that yet, is how I'd put it. Mm. I'm not opposed to the idea at all. That's the long and the short of it for me. And also, I don't want to. What one of the problems you sometimes get because now this this is uh, this is where I'm going to go on. Uh, you have a tendency in media where you have um, uh, a disabled character who's. Um, uh, disability is, you know, kind of, uh, how shall I put it, 
uh, offset a little bit by giving them some sort of superpowers and like <laughs> kind of halfway implying that the uh, the superpowers are compensating for the disability or the the disability is a price that you pay for the superpowers, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know the kind of thing I'm talking like, about. Like Daredevil? Is that, that kind of thing? Yeah, well, Daredevil is is uh, in in some ways one of the less egregious examples of this because like Daredevil at least has the excuse that he got a uh, a truck full of Marvel Comics chemicals dumped on him. Um, God, but you have this happen with characters who have like no specific superhero origins, like uh, blind characters who are like, oh my. Because I lost my eyesight, my hearing has become so sharp I can hear a fly fart on the next block. Like, <laughs> it's, um, which is not how that works. <laughs> like, I'm trying to, I'm, I may be slightly rambling a little bit, but like, you don't. When you lose, say, one of your senses or something like that, your other senses don't become any sharper magically because of that. That's not a thing that happens. It's just you learn to pay more attention to them because most people, by default, rely so much on eyesight. Um, and it's just... Uh, I feel like sometimes... Um, Sometimes the issue is that, um, were you about to say something, Jonas? No, I just, I remembered, I just remembered something about this style that I need to integrate, but go on, go on. Please. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes the issue is that, um, disability is a subject that makes, uh, a lot of people uncomfortable to, uh, talk about or to see, like there are people who, yeah are genuinely afraid of disabled people, which is mind-blowing to me. And it's um, always been weird to me, too. It's like... And that's probably part of the reason that uh, I include disabled people in uh, my stories and comics from time to time is because I don't have any visceral reaction against it. In fact, I think that it is... I thought that was interesting to uh, give Jack only one arm in house pets and uh, just yeah, like, work exactly. around that. It's like it, it also it creates interesting uh, it creates interesting character dynamics. It uh, might be a source of uh, especially in, like in house pets. It occasionally becomes a source of comedy that uh, oh, you don't yeah. otherwise disabled... have right there. And, and let me tell you, disabled people joke about their disabilities all the time. <laughs> like one of the uh, one of the characters in media who, even though she's technically one of those characters who kind of has like uh, uh, superpowers, like I said, um, one of the characters in media who does uh, one of the better jobs of uh, presenting the way. <laughs> the way disabled people act and talk is a uh, Toph from Avatar The Last Airbender. Uh, the way my ex described it was um, uh, that she has exactly the right combination of uh, sarcasm, uh, sarcasm plus not really caring about the fact that she has a disability, plus also a little bit of bitterness to the people around her. <laughs> Who uh who t uh, seem to like constantly like <laughs> forget about it or or the way she likes to mess with them when they forget about it, you know. In a uh, little story in third grade, um, I uh, I had a, a disabled teacher. Uh, he was in a wheelchair. Um, I, I guess paraplegic is it paraplegic when 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 the legs don't uh, um yeah i believe it's paraplegic when it's just the legs and quadriplegic when it's all four limbs right okay yeah um yeah i was his name was bob and um i never had a dis i never had a disabled teacher before and um and again i was i was like nine no i was eight i was eight years old and um at one point, uh, I came in from recess, and he was out of the wheelchair. He was sitting cross-legged on the on, on the rug, and obviously, you know, obviously, he, you know, it, it, it didn't occur to me at that age that he just ambled out of it or had someone help him. And I just, I stared at him like, he got out of the wheelchair. How did he do that? <laughs> He's magic, you know. 
<laughs> well, I mean, teachers teachers doing anything that you don't expect them to. I mean, seeing a teacher outside of school. But, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they exist outside of the school? Um, and that was always so weird, like, when you're in the, if you're in the grocery store with your parents or something like that and see your teacher shopping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's nothing that can quite compare to the weirdness of that feeling when you're a kid. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, let's like they see. eat too. Let's see. She's quotes? buying Easy Mac. <laughs> I thought teachers only ate difficult Mac. <laughs> anyway, um, let me. I'm catching up on the questions. Uh, let's see. Duster Seven Fifty asks a question for you, Rick. Care to discuss any potential story ideas you might have? been mulling for future Rick Griffin comics. I know we've seen a lot of your ideas, but surely you have some interesting stuff we haven't seen yet. Uh, assuming not a secret. I for comics in particular? Yeah. Yeah, I have like the next in the New Age comic in mind. I've had it in mind for several years because I've attempted to write it at least four times. But I know exactly what's going to happen in it. <laughs> Um, like other things, because the next in the New Age comic will actually feature the my wolf character Ideka. Oh, ooh! Oh, hey, Arse Mouse is in the chat. He says hi, Joe Nuts. Hey, dude. Catching up, catching up. Uh, <clears throat> Do we have any? Yeah, that's all the questions are. Um, you know, another character. Um, sorry, going going back one more time to the uh, the the topic of disability in in media. Another character who's a pretty good example is uh, Edward Elric from Full Metal Alchemist. Hmm. Because he has, like, um, what I find cool about him is that he has a, uh, a sci-fi style, um, sci-fi fantasy style um, uh, mobility aid in the sense of his, his auto mail. But uh, while that is, you know, a freaking miracle of uh, fantasy technology there... Uh, it still has uh, some some aspects of it that make a bit make it a bit of a pain in the ass to deal with. <laughs> oh, like maintenance, like, that kind of thing. Yeah, like maintenance, and I think he mentions uh, at some point that like it, in the desert it gets uncomfortably hot and kind of swells up a little. And I think uh, once or twice they deal with it irritating his skin where it touches. You know, it's cool. It's it's magic. It's <laughs> helpful, but it's not perfect. It's, mm. Like several times, I have to take like a time out of the plot in order to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that's kind of the way. To, yeah, and if it's too cold, it bothers him. It's just it's, like, uh, it's, it's like that's kind of how you want to do it because you want to uh, you want to look into how this affects the character how this uh how this informs the character um you know you don't want to just like like hand wave it away and the way you do that as a writer incidentally the best way to do that is to like ask questions of people who deal with things like this hmm. like they say write what you know and there's that advice is both good and terrible because if everyone only wrote only what they know uh, from the beginning, like you'd only have <laughs> stories about like mailmen or whatever. But uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> but I, read, a, I it, read an article a while ago about uh, all those uh, absurdly over-engineered uh, uh, replacement limbs, like ah uh, yes. I, I saw it because, like, it makes sense when you think about it, because a lot of these things are, it's basically just, like, technology. Like, 
Mm-hmm. Sometimes people just do it to make it look fancy, like or do all the kinds of things. It's like, oh, you can do this with your arm, you can do this with your arm, you need to this, this, and uh, it will be just like having an actual arm. But the actual practice of using it is just really uh, difficult and uh, overcomplicated. And a lot of those, uh, they just go back to like the regular replacement limbs because those usually only have even though those only have like a couple features uh it's a lot easier to keep track of it all (laughs) yeah yeah and those may be the features that they will actually use yeah (laughs) because one of the major issues is people simply uh not asking what they need (laughs) like it's just it's a problem it's a problem people often don't ask the uh the people they're trying to help uh, what they want, what they need, because there's kind of a, an unspoken assumption that uh, I guess they already know what they need and don't have to ask. Yeah, because the, like the unspoken assumption here is that they want a, they need a replacement that functions that uh, at least looks towards functioning exactly like a human hand, like a regular human, biological human hand. But uh, until we reach the place where you can actually just, like, replace the hand exactly as it was, uh, all those intermittent steps are usually unnecessary. They're instructive for technology, but they're not helpful for the actual people who are using them. (laughs) Mm -mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're cool. They're, They're interesting. We learn from them. And perhaps that's a step in the direction of creating a fully functional artificial hand, but they're not necessarily practical <laughs> at this uh, at this current phase of uh, human existence. And uh, practicality is still king. <laughs> that sounds like the something a practical would say. Yeah. Well, you know what, your face. Rude. So now we're getting back to the usual. <laughs> Twist. <laughs> Gonna go back to our twist banter. Um, yes, our twanter. Let's see. Any more questions for Rick? Any more questions for Rick? Any questions for Jonas? Any questions for me? Any questions for um, um, CalArts Penny? <laughs> I actually legitimately, like, unironically love this picture, Jonas. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. You can put it on the Patreon if you want. Um, let me, uh, I need to, like, I want to try, I'm trying for a certain. BRB changing the entire comics art style. <laughs> 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 BRB pitching this to Cartoon Network. <laughs> God. God, can you imagine? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's educational. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're we're horrible people. Um, <laughs> speak for yourself. I mean, yes, I am, but speak for yourself. <laughs> Let's see. Oops, no, 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 that's not what I want to do. There we go, that's it. Let's see, questions, Mr. Stoker, can I go to the bathroom? You can. <laughs> There's like a certain look to this stuff, and like it, part of it's the color palette, and I'm trying to like... 
I'm, now I'm trying to like emulate that. Uh oh, Jonas is overthinking it. Hey, it's like it just. Uh... <laughs> oh no! Why are you? <laughs> why am I what, Jonas? Why? Why you sassing me, huh? I've always been so <laughs> nice to you. <laughs> yeah, Jonas has never done anything to me ever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, I should probably. Uh, I mean, uh, you guys can keep going if you want, but I should probably wrap this up soon. If uh, I need to conserve at least a little bit of voice in case we're uh, doing uh, Kirby tonight or anything like that. Oh yeah, are we doing any any game tonight that you know, of, Rick? Rick? Did we lose Rick? Uh, he's still on the call. Oh, I'm hearing a static. Shit. Sorry, I got a call. Oh, okay. Uh, All right, no worries. Was the call coming from inside the house? Yeah, no. It was coming okay. from down the street. Uh, well, you know, that uh, that entire concept is a lot less creepy in the uh, era of cell phones. But anyway. <laughs> it's coming from uh, the same cell phone tower. I don't know. We, uh, we uh, were... were Asking if uh, if you think you're going to be doing any game stream tonight, or if you're taking the night off, I'd probably be okay for doing a game stream. Okay. I think it's going to be Kirby DRG. Uh, Kirby we already DRG. did DRG last night, so it's probably going to be Kirby. Okay. Cool. Is DRG becoming like a, a regular Saturday night thing? I don't know how this works. Well, it it seems to be uh, the weekends are better for everybody to get together. Sense. So, by the way, I love those portraits there. <laughs> those are really cute. Yeah, they're adorable. They're like uh, King and Bailey's con badges. Uh, they are con badges for King and Bailey. They're suitors. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> nice. To Rick from MDBJC, why did why Sabrina don't want Fido to join her on an adventure, and does he know she goes on epic quest? Uh, she doesn't want him to go on adventures because she knows that they're incredibly dangerous for normals. <laughs> Mitz asks, Rick, did you ever get your honk avatar working? Your what avatar? I don't know. I think it was... Was it one of the ones that... Uh... Is is the Honk Avatar Goose West? <laughs> no, I think Honk is one of the uh, designers of... Like, like, it's one of the programs to make those, like, VTuber avatars. <clears throat> oh, I see. Honk <laughs> is the program for that. Yeah. Uh, Stoker, when slash how did you learn to translate your ideas into comic form? Because that's my biggest trouble. I know exactly in super detail how I want the story to go for a comic project, but I don't know how to synthesize it into a presentable format. Okay, so like, here's here's the thing, and this is um, this is going to be an answer that's partially satisfactory and partially unsatisfactory. So buckle up. Um. The first thing for me is that uh, I mostly write my scripts in um, uh, a format very similar to the format that is used in uh, movie and TV scripts. Um, and I, I kind of think about them in my head. I think about them in the way I would think of uh, movies and TV shows. Um, like the the timing of the gags is is like that in my head uh the the inflection of the dialogue like in my head they're little movies um now how much detail to put into a comic script varies wildly because while there are extremely and i mean extremely stringent guidelines for uh, how TV and movie scripts are to be formatted. Like, they are so obsessive over the formatting that if you bind the pages in the wrong way, they'll throw your script out um, without even looking at it. I'm serious. I'm serious. The side has to have three holes punched 
and uh, you put the uh, the the I forget what it's called. You know those those clips that you put through that expand. You don't use staples. You put them in the top hole and the bottom hole and leave the middle hole empty. And if you don't do it exactly that way, your script will not be looked at. <laughs> it will be discarded out of hand. Hollywood. Um, yeah. But uh, whereas there are extremely stringent guidelines for uh, those kinds of scripts, there's nothing like that for comics. Comics is the Wild West when it comes to scripts. Um, I've looked at examples of the way comic writers do their scripts. Everyone does it differently. Um, <laughs> and some artists don't like you to go into absurd detail. Some of them do. But some of them prefer that you leave a lot of that stuff up to them to figure out. Uh, for example, we have a thumbnail artist on uh, the Penny Project. Uh, our thumbnail artist is, uh, by day, uh, a professional storyboarder for various animation things. And like by most night of they the fight people. crime. Yes, Sorry, and by night they fight crime. Um, <laughs> uh, like most of the people on uh, the Penny Project, uh, they're working under, you know, pseudonyms and anonymity, so I'm not going to go into any, any details whatsoever about who they are and what they've worked on. But uh, their pseudonyms, synonyms, and antonyms. Go on. It's Sorry. true. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm getting sassy. Go on. <laughs> their, um, their preference is for me to just provide the description and let them work out uh, the, the layouts and uh, where everything goes, the layouts, the compositions, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it just really depends on your artist. It depends on your artist and it depends on your vision. Yeah. And... Uh, my vision uh, has enough wiggle room in it that I can trust the artists. And also the artists I'm working with are amazing enough. <laughs> and I truly mean that. I'm not just trying to pump up Jonas's ego. Uh, everyone on this team is super, super good. Yeah. It's um, seriously. Like this is top level skill here. I am um, consistently blown away by the stuff that's thrown around on the server. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. Everyone is so good. But um I hope that gives you some uh some insight. Also, uh sorry Mitz, uh your your query, uh what was it that that you asked? I don't know if we actually uh saw that one. Yeah, I think we missed it. Or was it the Honk Avatar one? Oh, it was the Honk Avatar. Oh, one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um did you ever get that working, Rick? Oh no, is Rick gone again? Uh, I think yeah, that's the ready think. for eating food. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Uh did the the question was did the, uh, did you ever get your honk avatar working? Or whatever that thing is. Yeah, it's working. I've been using it. <laughs> I wasn't sure because I don't know what, what programs you crazy kids with your 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 V tubes and your and your YouTube poops and your your dubs and your subs and your nubs. I don't know how this stuff works. <laughs> I don't know nothing about nothing. We should probably wrap it up because I'm sure you probably want to eat Rick and like um Who wants to eat Rick? <laughs> eat Rick. Otherwise we won't have any more comics. Thank you, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, I've got a quick question, Rick, because this is actually, uh, before we do wrap it up, this is, this is fairly relevant. Um, is the, the shop that's selling, um, the books and the sign stuff and all that, is that only open during the, the con hours this weekend? Yes, because it's already up to like, what, 60 orders and I'm going to have to actually do all those physically myself to <laughs> fulfill them. Nice. I think you need to do them metaphysically, personally. But that's just me. <laughs> I'll probably like, actually close asking. it like uh, before I go to bed, and not like right at the uh, end of the stream. But <laughs> yeah. Okay, I was just asking because I was thinking about picking up that A and H uh, one and two or whatever. Whatever it is, I forget. Is it one and two? One, two, three. I don't. It's one, remember. two, and three. Okay. Oh, oops. Um, I like A and H Club. It's one of my favorites. All right. Any, any, oh, hang on. We got um, one more question. What is an idea you have had for your characters slash series that you wanted to do but ultimately couldn't? Um, well, <laughs> I, 
my answer is I haven't really done any of my series yet, so I can't say whether uh, I have or haven't done those things that you suggested. Anyway, um, I'd say I've had more ideas over the years, and not just just specifically for the current comic that I'm doing, but uh, comics in general. I have had a truly ridiculous number of ideas, and very few of them have seen the light of day so far. <laughs> And you know that's okay. You know, I mean, not not every idea needs to see fruition. I mean, you know, th- there is that feeling uh, when you first have it, like oh, I've got to, I've got to finish this, or I'm not worthy. But like, you know, in the end, you know, you're only one person, and it's okay to let stuff go. You know, sometimes ideas evolve and find their way into other other forms or whatever. You know. Um. Just because something doesn't come out the way you think it should doesn't mean it's no good. Or that it's... Oh, that, it's a, a that was very time. well put, Jonas. Yeah, I'm a poet and I don't even know it. Um, okay, any more questions? Um, uh, Frozen Tempest asks, have you ever had people ask to color your line art, Rick? Yes, all the time. <laughs> I, 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 I asked him. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I think we're uh, we're ready. Yeah, the out. second uh, edition of A and H Club is already sold out. Yeah, I was trying to uh, buy up all the rest of uh, the original edition of that, so that I could, uh, so that I could actually advertise it as being available on Amazon, and you will definitely get uh, the second edition. So uh, I have like a zillion copies of the first edition because more were laying around. I only managed to get 10 copies of the second edition. Oh, that's funny. (laughs) Now, is this the, uh, again, is this the collected 1, 2, and 3 we're talking about? Yes, it's still the collected 1, 2, and 3. The second edition just has a new cover and uh, some additional, a few pages of additional artwork inside of it. Mm. Oh, I see. See, I'm learning stuff all over the place today. <laughs> I'm learning all over myself. <laughs> so, uh, what else? What else? Um, oh, for those who don't know, Rick will be guest of honor at uh, Texas Furry Fiesta next year. Yeah, so it'll be next oh. year. Third, third time's the charm. Third time's the it, charm. It'll be awesome. It'll be awesome. And uh, I am... Jonas and I, well, I know I am. I can't speak for Jonas. I'm planning on being there next year. Jonas, do you think you're going to try to make it? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on a budget, at least. I'm going to set aside a budget. I'm gonna, I, I know when uh, the room block usually opens up, um, so I will try. Uh, it's going to depend on a number of factors, including my own like, life situation at that point, but I am going to try. So, so I might be there, too. Sweet. Um, Blazecast asks, have you guys ever used paint tool side? Yeah, once upon a time. Um, still use it every once in a while for like sketching and stuff. Not very often though. Um, I tried paint tool SAI. I didn't, I didn't click with it immediately, so I never really picked it up again. CSB <laughs> ended up being more of what I needed. Yeah, same here. That's valid. You're valid, Rick. You're valid. Well, thank you. Nah, Jonas, you're mostly valid. (laughs) (laughs) You got a little bit of invalidity around the edges. Oh, no! And yes, invalidity is a word. Thank you. (laughs) Nice. All right. Well, you know what? Um, I'm going... (laughs) What is it, Jonas? No, I just said I see we seamlessly transition to the bullying Jonas segment. Yeah, <laughs> um, I uh, I'm about ready to uh, call it a day. Um, I thank you, everyone who has popped in for this. It's been uh, a blast. I'm really glad that I got a chance to discuss all these fascinating topics with you guys. Um, I'm probably going to need a nap now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this has been fun. This has been uh, a lot of fun. And thank you, Rick, for hosting this thing. Uh, it's uh, it's it's really great to uh, have a little slice of the con experience. I've 
I've definitely missed it in the last few years. <laughs> um, Haven't and, we all? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Stoker. For, uh, yeah, I know, I know. It, Sorry. It, it, but better, better times will uh, will come again. And, but I want it now. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Mood. Um. But uh, I don't know, Rick. Do you have anything uh, you wanted to add? Bailey's so cute. Bailey is cute. They're all Bailey. cute. King is cute. I'm exactly like Kitsune. I ship well, everyone x everyone. King is like 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 pick him up and give him a hug. Cute. <laughs> Bailey's Bailey's cute. Um, Bailey's so. just like uh, hug her and bury your face in her chest, kind of cute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my! <laughs> this is uh, it's it's reaching that point, huh? Yeah. <laughs> that part of the stream, huh? All right. Um. Well, uh, yeah, I can't think of anything else to wrap it up with, so uh, we'll probably see some of you uh, over on over on Twitch. And uh, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for coming out. It's been it's been great. Yeah, thank you. All right, everyone, have a magical evening. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good night, everybody. Good night, you guys. Na na. And I am about to eat some food, but before I do that, time to start putting on movies for the evening. That's literally all that I have. <laughs> <laughs>